Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington Select Board for Monday, September 20th, 2021. This is Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan? Yes. John Hurd? Yes. Len Diggins? Yes. Eric Helmuth? Yes. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdelaine? Yes. Doug Heim? And Board Administrator Ashley Marr is participating remotely. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act signed into law on June 16, 2021, that extends certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency. The act includes an extension until April 1, 2022, of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020, executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. We have a short but important agenda this evening, so let's see how much of the town's business we can get done tonight. Um, I will turn to the next item uh, on the agenda, item two, ARPA funding presentation. Um, before I turn it over to the town manager, we put the acronym in there for the funding for, um, for the um, for the agenda item. ARPA, of course, is the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. It was signed into law back in March. As part of that um, act, there is about $350 billion that was granted to state and local governments. And as the town manager will explain, of that $350 billion, Arlington is, will be receiving 35.2 million, um, it is subject to audit and subject to um, identifying uses that are consistent with the act and the, and the rules. So with that, I will turn it over to the town manager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what I'd like to do is walk through a presentation that I provided at a, town, a virtual town forum several weeks ago, and then take the present down and answer any questions and certainly receive any feedback that the board has if that's okay with the board. Um, so let me just share my screen. Okay. Whoops. All right. Can everybody see that on the board? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so that was a great introduction, Mr. Chairman, uh, to the American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA as we call it, to try to save some save some syllables with the acronym. Uh, and, and as you put it, uh, really an incredible funding source for municipalities across the country, and certainly a very meaningful funding source for Arlington as it looks to recover from the pandemic. And within the allowable uses uh, that are laid out in ARPA, and then subsequent rules issued by the Department of Treasury at the federal level, we really do feel like we can have both a meaningful and lasting impact on Arlington and the community through the allocation of these funds. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the timeline as, um, as we've laid it out, uh, walk through the, the actual uh, areas from the statute that ARPA funds are eligible to be expended upon, walk through the specific framework that we have developed, and then uh, again, very um, interested in hearing your questions and feedback tonight. So I think as the board knows, we opened up a comment period 
in early August for members of the public to submit comments on the framework that you will comment on tonight. On September 9th, we conducted a virtual forum to be able to present again, much of what you're going to hear tonight, uh, as well as take comments and questions from the public. That night, we extended the comment period to September 19th. So the public comment period actually closed yesterday. Uh, we had been planning on presenting to the board a week ago today on September 13th. Um, and you, you'll note I amended the date from what had been presented at the virtual town forum. And we're now here tonight presenting on September 20th. Previously, uh, I had proposed coming back to the select board for endorsement of something that was approaching a final framework on September 27th. But given that today is September 20, uh, 20th, um, I certainly wanted the opportunity to um, have the time to make updates based on what the board, um, what the board's feedback, comments, and questions are tonight, and more time to incorporate uh, feedback we've received from the public uh, with the public comment uh, period closing yesterday. So I'm proposing that I, instead of coming back a week from today, that I come back at the board's next meeting, which is actually Wednesday, mm -hmm. October 13th, uh, for what will be a request for select board endorsement. And I think right now is actually a good time to mention that, and I said this at the virtual town forum, um, because of the fact that we're still operating under what's called an interim final rule, there's still updates coming from Treasury. And frankly, we're not really even clear when a final rule on what um, on eligibility criteria or rules around ARPA will be issued. I think it's important that we can agree to an allocation methodology with some details as we'll talk about tonight for certain programming, but also understanding it is almost a guarantee that we will make changes to those allocations through more public discussion. As we learn more about eligibility criteria, as we learn more about the programs and what they might actually cost that are being proposed, I, I think we should all um, go into this understanding. This is a big sum of money and we will likely not have something cemented in stone um, on October 13th, but rather a framework that we in large agree to um, and we can move forward and starting to actually develop some details around those programming as well. We gain a better understanding around eligibility as it comes from the federal government. So with that, I'll go through these pretty quickly. Um, these are again, directly from ARPA. These are the expenditure categories. And I have found it helpful to just, I, I hate to read slides, but to read through these so we can get a common understanding of what the intention, what the legislative intent of ARPA was. So the first one, which makes great sense given its um, nexus from the pandemic is supporting public health expenditures by among other uses, funding COVID-19 mitigation efforts, medical expenses, behavioral health care, mental health and substance misuse treatment, and certain public health and safety personnel responding to the crisis. And I think you'll see when we get into the framework, there are expenditures directly related to this section of the statute. The next section, addressing negative economic impacts caused by the public health emergency, including by rehiring public sector workers, providing aid to households facing food, housing, or other financial insecurity, offering small business assistance, and extending support for industries hardest hit by the crisis. Again, um, makes a lot of sense based on the economic impacts of the pandemic. And again, I think you'll directly see areas of the framework that stem from this section of the statute. Next, aid the communities and populations hardest hit by the crisis, supporting an equitable recovery by addressing not only the immediate harms of the pandemic, but its exacerbation of longstanding public health, economic, and educational disparities. Uh, again, this one starts to be more of a forward-looking aim of the statute, and I think you'll also see um, that within the framework, we have several recommendations aimed at this portion of the statute. Next, providing premium pay for essential workers, offering additional support to those who have borne and will bear the greatest health risks because of their service during the pandemic. Uh, again, within the framework, a very specific line item dedicated to premium pay stemming right from this section of the statute. And then finally, investing in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure, improving access to clean drinking water, supporting vital wastewater and stormwater infrastructure, and expanding access to broadband internet. Once again, uh, you'll directly see as we get, dive into the framework, uh, our proposed investments stemming from this section of the statute. So with that, um, 
feeling like, Mr. Chair, pause for any questions the board might have about some of the baseline information before we dive in. Sure, yeah, why don't we do that? And I'll just, if there's a, I'll do it by show of hand rather than going right down the line. If there's any questions on the framework, if any members have, if you could signal me, uh, otherwise we'll move on and there will be time for questions later. Okay, and, oh, okay, I think everybody is okay. Is, it, is that a question, Mrs. Mahan, or, or okay. Um, sorry, I'm trying to do unmute and all that stuff. Um, I do have comments regarding the premium pay. Is this the uh, appropriate time to speak to that or should I wait? I, th I think I, I would wait. I think this is more the, the the town manager laid out the various categories if there's questions about those categories. But when we get into the specifics of the line items, I think we can return to that. Okay, when we get to that, I definitely have um, sure. comments on the 1.5 million drastically low for premium pay. Okay, um, Mr. Helmuth. Yeah, just a question about the overall timeline. I apologize if this was covered, but um, could the town manager clarify what the rules are or the expected rules will be for how, what the period of time is the town has to actually expend these funds and to what extent, if any, but regardless of the category, can we reserve them for other purposes or do they have to be spent? And if so, when, what period of time do we think that'll be? So there's really two, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Helmuth, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. There's really two timeliness tests uh, laid out in the statute. One is regarding allocation, and the next is regarding actual expenditure of the funds. So uh, you see actually laid here on the screen, years one, two, three, and four. Year four stretches into calendar year 24, uh, which uh, I believe we have to allocate by July 31st, 24, but can expend up until December 31st, 26. So we have a, a fairly lengthy period of time to be able to spend the funds. Uh, but we need to make our allocation decisions in a slightly um, quicker fashion than the actual expenditures. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Anybody else with questions just on the, the framework? Okay. Um, I can, why don't you go ahead, Mr. Chaplain? Okay. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. All right. So I'll, I'll walk through line by line. Um, I won't dive in in too great of detail because I know the board um, has seen the memorandums that are available for some, not all of these expenditure categories. And if there isn't any backup information provided, I'll explain uh, why briefly. So the first category you see is uh, designated as revenue loss general fund. This is a, a section that's, a, this is a recommended allocation source or allocation category here based on an allowance within ARPA, within the statute for calculating revenue losses by the town and being able to use ARPA funds to recover from those revenue losses. We have done internal calculations ourselves, as well as hiring our outside audit firm that annually provides the town's financial audit to run calculations for our actual revenue loss with the base year being calendar year 2019, the first year allowed for comparison being 2020, you can then look at 21 and then 22. Right now, we are not, uh, our calculations do not demonstrate that we'll be able to claim revenue loss. The main reason for that is that the debt exclusion for the high school began in calendar year 2020. So we had a significant increase in tax revenue based on the high school project, but those monies can only be expended on the debt service or the borrowing associated with the high school. So we've been advocating with the Mass Municipal Association and the National League of Cities, our legislative delegation in Washington, to try to get Treasury to issue an updated rule that will allow us to claim revenue loss. So this will be an area where there'll be more discussion in regards to whether or not we actually can allocate the funds to this line item. Uh, but I did want to keep this here for now, given the possibility that we would be able to use it to offset revenue losses in the future and provide some benefit to the town's general fund. Next, a uh, very clear category taken from the statute and the items I mentioned earlier, public health. These are investments being recommended by Director of Health and Human Services, Christine Bongiorno, and as enumerated in the memorandum uh, provided to the board as well as made publicly available on the town's website. Next, we have premium pay. Again, that's very directly taken from the statute. 
And this is an allocation that would be focused on providing those town workers that uh, had to perform their work in person and therefore put themselves in harm way, harm's way in terms of the virus uh, to be able to be allocated premium pay for that service, those services that they delivered. Next, you see a category of mental health support with three categories. We have crisis intervention support, which is directly focused uh, on assisting the Arlington Police Department uh, with their social work response model. The AYCC subsidy program, helping the Arlington Youth Counseling Center, which is operated by the town within the Department of Health and Human Services in providing more mental health services to the youth of the community. And we have built in a mental health reserve. We heard uh, before the virtual town forum, definitely during uh, the virtual town forum and in comments that have continued to come in about the need to invest in mental health in the community. So we put in a reserve, though there isn't a detailed plan on how we would expend those funds available today so that we could continue to study and analyze how we could best help use these funds to meet mental health and behavioral health needs in the community. All leading up to this, you can see the mental health support total in each individual year and carried out over the life of the framework. Next, low-income broadband support. Again, directly tied to one of the categories or one of the allowances or eligibility areas um, within the statute. I've recently learned that a rule has been issued by, uh, by the uh, Treasury that is saying that only places that do not currently have broadband can utilize ARPA funds for broadband, but there's a strong advocacy effort underway from cities across the country to change that rule. If that rule stands, we wouldn't be able to use those funds because almost every corner of Arlington has existing broadband. Um, I'm hopeful that it will change so that we can partner uh, with community partners, maybe specifically the Arlington Housing Authority on providing low-income broadband support. But we'll keep watching that to see whether or not the eligibility changes. Next, uh, you see two corresponding categories, small business assistance and tenant assistance. Once again, directly related to eligibility criteria made, um, made possible by the statute. Uh, these are two areas where there are detailed memorandums provided by the Department of Planning and Community Development on how both of these programs would operate. I think as the board knows, the town was able to offer small business assistance and tenant assistance throughout a great portion of the pandemic through a community development block grant or CDBG funds uh, that I know several members of the board um, were part of those discussions. These funds would continue that, but also expand the eligibility for both businesses and tenants that could benefit from these funds. And from the applications we received from the prior community development block grant monies, we have a strong sense that there is a lot of need in the community for these funds. We have heard, and I haven't made any changes, I should have actually said I haven't made any changes to this save one I'll mention at the end um, since the virtual town forum, because I really wanted to hear from the board before I started making edits after the public comment period. Uh, but I will say we have heard loud and clear from the arts community about a desire to be able to be eligible for small business assistance. The current, uh, we currently contemplate that they would be eligible for small business assistance, but based on what we've heard from the public and depending on board feedback tonight, we very well may come back in October with a specific line item for assisting the arts community. Moving beyond small business assistance and tenant assistance, we move into addressing food insecurity, again, directly addressed within uh, the sections of the statute that I referenced earlier. I've reached out to both uh, the leadership of Foodlink and Arlington Eats, and the figures that you see in the spreadsheet before you are based on proposals that they have submitted to me uh, over the course of the next four-year period. Um, we believe both would be eligible, but we're going to continue to work with both programs uh, to learn a little bit more about what their needs are and make sure that we're maximizing uh, what they need to be successful in serving and reducing food insecurity or providing food security within Arlington. So I'm gonna to go to the next half of the spreadsheet. So the next line you see are HVAC improvements, heating, ventilation, air conditioning improvements. This is not necessarily something that seems clear from the HVAC, uh, excuse me, from the, uh, the statu uh, statutory criteria that I mentioned earlier, but certainly within the interim final rule, investments in HVAC systems in public facilities is an allowable expenditure. We have many HVAC improvement 
uh, needs, some of which that are already contained in the capital plan of the town, some are, have not made it into the capital plan yet. And we're launching this fall a building electrification study uh, to help with our net zero goals. And our hope is that we'd be able to allocate some or all of these funds towards making improvements across really our entire building fleet. Next, you see investment, a misspelling of investment, investment in parks and open spaces. This one, again, not clearly mentioned in the statutory criteria, but through a Q&A or an FAQ issued by Treasury, we learned that almost certainly uh, updates or maintenance, excuse me, maintenance and upkeep of playgrounds and parks will be an allowable ARPA expenditure, as well as possibly reconstruction or replacement of playground structures. So I have put a pretty significant amount of money in here for that investment. I think as this board knows every year within our capital plan and within the Community Preservation Act, we invest a significant amount of money in our parks and open spaces and playgrounds, but because of how many we have in town and, and the use of them, which, is all, which are all good things, we struggle to keep up. Being able to make this investment would really have a tremendous impact, not only on the quality of life of people in town, but also on the town's capital plan, which would provide um, either relief and or more flexibility for the town's general fund budget. Next, oh, and I should say that, that that's, this is another category that we're gonna continue to work and analyze and really try to get a final determination on whether or not it will be eligible. Next, you see water and sewer spending. Again, clearly tied to the last criteria uh, within the statute. Uh, this is the singular biggest category you see in this framework. Um, it is certainly backed up by the needs, uh, the need to invest in the infrastructure. Uh, Mike Rademacher provided a pretty detailed memo of all of the areas that he would like to see investments made. Uh, some are simply water main and sewer pipe reconstruction or replacement. <clears throat> some relates to pump stations. Some of these investments would relate to water meter replacements. Some would relate to lead, line, uh, lead service line removal. Some would relate to um, inflow and infiltration, really trying to get at all of the needs within our water, sewer, uh, water and sewer system. And this could have a really impactful, um, really big impact, I should say, on ratepayers in town. I can't sit here tonight and say it could reduce water and sewer rates, but I think I could confidently say it would go a long way to mitigating future rate increases, not eliminating, but mitigating future, future rate increases. So we think this is a very important investment um, to consider as we go forward. Next, another big category, uh, affordable housing with uh, we have five subcategories under affordable housing, uh, directly tied to reducing historical inequities um, as mentioned and referenced in the statute. So we have a capital request from the Arlington Housing Authority for replacement of windows at Monotony Manor. And that makes up the cumulative $2.5 million in years one and two in this plan. We have a request from the Arlington Housing Authority uh, for the purchase of a new van to bring residents to medical appointments and grocery trips and other needs they need to have met. And that's that $35,000 amount. The Arlington Housing Authority is requesting support um, for funding a resident support services program uh, or staff position. And you can see that $46,000 amount carried over the life of the plan. Next, moving away from the Housing Authority, you can see we have projected or put a placeholder in for funds for affordable unit housing production, affordable housing unit production, excuse me, uh, totaling $3 million over the life of the plan. And what that would likely go to is either potentially grant awards to a group like the Housing Corporation of Arlington, or potentially take the shape of a deposit into our affordable housing trust fund that's recently been created. Um, I think there's still timeliness concerns that we need to work through that will determine whether or not we could make a deposit into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. But if timeliness concerns could be, um, could be dealt with, I think that would be a potentially great source for where some of these ARPA funds could go to be able to address affordable housing needs. And then the final category under affordable housing is labeled as deepening affordability of units in the pipeline. And what we mean by that is looking at affordable units that are already permitted to be constructed and determine whether or not through a cash payment, we could reduce some of those units from, let's say 80% AMI eligibility down to 60% AMI eligibility, 
or lower, lo lower basically the income thresholds of who would access those units, which would be, again, deepening the affordability of the units in the pipeline. Much work still to be done to determine whether or not this is a viable or feasible area, but internally we believe this could have a big impact on improving access to affordable units in Arlington. Next, a line item uh, directly labeled homelessness. I think as this board knows, um, we've done great work as a town over the past several years with the Arlington Police Department, Arlington Health and Human Services, partnering with the Somerville Homeless Coalition, support also from the Department of Planning and Community Development to really work with homeless populations in Arlington. Unfortunately, we've struggled and the whole region has struggled to come up with a real coherent regional approach to dealing with homelessness. And what we're hoping is that we can be part of a regional effort. And we've started to already make some inroads and conducted outreach to our neighboring communities to determine what type of regional approach uh, to homelessness might be able to be put together through these ARPA funds, knowing that many of our neighbors who also struggle with homelessness have significant ARPA funds that they might be able to contribute towards this effort as well. Next, administration and oversight. Uh, what you see here is funding for uh, what would be ultimately a temporary staff position to manage the administration and oversight of these funds, as well as putting aside um, just a little bit of extra money for potential consultancy with our outside auditors who would need to audit these funds on a year in and year out basis. Um, so for the first year, we put aside more money than the remaining years uh, because we wanted to make sure we had enough um, for any initial audit engagements that we would need to establish our expenditure planning. And then in the out years, uh, we put in a sum of money that would um, certainly cover both salary benefits and any outside auditing costs we might incur for administration and oversight. And then finally, the reserve line is the only change that I've made to this since the virtual town forum. Uh, we learned, as was pointed out to us by one of the attendees at the virtual town forum, that the county allocation that the town is receiving via ARPA had actually been changed. So we had been using a rough, an approximate $34 million figure. Uh, and as Chair DeCourcy mentioned at the start of this, our actual figure is $35,247,893. So we set aside the balance between the 34 million and the actual 35.2 million in a reserve for discussion about where that could be allocated in the future. So with that, just to recap, um, as the board knows, we opened a comment period in August, closed that in September 19th, conducted a virtual forum on September 9th. We're here tonight on September 20th for the select board's review, comment, and feedback. And then the plan would be to come back before the board on October 13th to seek endorsement of this framework of a path forward for the expenditure of these ARPA funds. So with that, I think, I think I'll stop sharing. Does that sound right to you, Mr. Chair, and then answer questions as appropriate? Yeah, and, and I think it, what it may be helpful as we go along, I'll wait till members' questions come up, maybe to put the table that has the amounts in it just so we can go back and forth. But let's let's wait and see what members have for, for questions. Um, so I'll turn to the board now. We will offer public comment um, after board questions tonight on this or public questions or comments. Um, and I will start with Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have some comments. But first, I have a question um, through the chair to the town manager. Uh, I know you've held these forums. Um, have you met with any of the unions as you said you would do back in August? I have met um, and discussed with one union in particular. And I've had, I wouldn't say they were meetings, but discussions with another union. And there's more meetings that we will need to have with unions on these, on these matters. Okay, so you haven't gotten really feedback from the union. Or solicited it. Um, no, I, I will. I all of them, no. So I would say some of them, yes. Some some of them, I think I've heard their feedback um, loud and clear in regards to these expenditures. Okay, uh, I, I'm just noting you said you have spoken with one union. Can you share with me who that is? Yes, that would be AFSME. I'm sorry. AFSME. Okay. Um, 
<clears throat> I just want to say, and I'm hoping I can get enough of my colleagues to support this. One of the main tenants of um, opera funds has been to um, compensate our essential workers who worked in 2019, 2020, now 2021. Um, basically being, you know, people on the street that can't do um, work from home. I know, uh, and I had conversations with the manager in a meeting with Karen Malloy about hybrid work, working from home, which I'm in support of um, because it can be done because I've been doing it. It can be tracked. Um, but what I said to the manager and Karen Malloy is I would hope that the ease uh, of working from home, the hybrid model, model, I mean, that basically went in little discussion available to everyone. Um, you can't sit in your driveway um, in a bucket truck and provide services to the town. You can't sit in your living room um, and provide uh, police response to the town or EMS or fire services. So my personal feeling is um, if that was a benefit that we very easily transitioned into non-union um, workers, if it was available to union workers, there probably would have been more pushback. Um, and my only thing has been to the manager and, and Karen Malloy that we treat our union workers the same as we do our non-union workers. Whatever we can do, especially in light of what they've been through. Um, I know <clears throat> we've had union workers that were concerned about their loved ones that asked the town if they could pay for housing because they didn't feel safe going home. And the town said no. And I understand that. Um, because they didn't have the money. I know union workers that pitched tents in their yards and paid for hotel uh, arrangements so they didn't have to go home and infect their newborns, their loved ones with cancer or immunosuppressed. And part of the opera money is to um, address that sacrifice that they gave. I know that, you know, the board voted to put a banner across Mass Ave. We got two pieces of wood from Home Depot or Lowe's and got decals from like Paw Patrol. I don't even understand what it is. But my thing is now with APRA money, APRA money, this is where we can say, we're gonna back up that we support essential workers. And I'm very insulted that there's only 1.5 million in there. If we did the maps under the US Treasury guidelines, which I have reviewed and I've, I've discussed with the manager and others, um, just one of my colleagues, because I didn't want to violate the uh, quorum rule. Uh, if we gave them the map, uh, if I look at the money as proposed by the town manager, it's just one year of 1.5 million and nothing else after that. To me, that's an insult. If we gave our union essential workers that we've all been going on and on about, oh, you're so great and we you know, wish we could, you know, do something for you and it's so invaluable this is how we can do it if we if we gave them the math it would be about 14 to 15 percent of these money it would be for 2019 2020 and 2021 about six thousand to sixty five hundred a year we give our town manager a twenty four thousand dollar a year housing allowance to live in arlington um i think the union workers are really being treated unfairly um and to me it's kind of an insult and not backing up what we say that one of the three tenants that the president when he talks about these funding this funding there's 10 categories but the top three the first or second thing he speaks to is providing compensation to our essential workers this is our opportunity to do it i want to give them the max. I know I've had conversations with the manager talking about maximizing the most we can give to them. To me, 1.5 million, one year allocation only is such an insult. And I would not support anything that the manager proposes if that's what's in there. So what I would say to my colleagues is um, one of the first things we should do of what these monies were set out for, not for reserve funds, not for administrative, can I get that $150,000 a year job 
I would like to get it. I only get three thousand a year. Um, you know, um, we need to. This is our opportunity to um, give back to our essential workers who are putting their lives. And I, I don't mean to sound like I'm melodramatic, but I really believe it. They're putting their lives and their families' lives on the line when our other employees who can work from home and get additional stipends um, and, and receive that money, why are we not giving it back to them? So I'm, I'm really upset. I'm not going to go into any of the other categories. I could say where, you know, um, money could come from. Uh, I understand this, uh, you know, one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars a year for homelessness. I've worked with Arlington Police and the Somerville Homeless Coalition. They need thirty to fifty thousand a year, but we're giving them one fifty. I mean, I could find places where we could um, be able to give as close to, and in my opinion, the max to essential workers. I think that needs to be something we need to address offhand. Um, and I'm really upset what the managers put before us. In my opinion, a pittance of 1.5 million, one year only. Every other category has beyond one year. If you look at the, and I know my colleagues have, uh, look at the spreadsheet before it. Um, to me, that's an insult. Um, and, and, and my last thing I would say, which is what I said to the manager and when I met with Karen Malloy, why can't we treat our union workers, our police, Fire public works with the same compassion and expediency as we do with our non-union employees, as we do with stipends that we give them, as we do with uh, you can work from home, but we can track it. So uh, I'm hoping that I can get at least two of my colleagues to agree with me that the pittance of 1.5 million in one year for all of our union employees that went out and risked. Honestly, most of them don't care about their lives, but they care about their loved ones' lives, which they did risk, which they did incur money for not going back to their homes for fear of when COVID first came out, nobody really knew anything about it. So they rented hotel rooms, they slept in tents in the yards. The town said, see you later, we can't help you. So I'm hoping at least two of my colleagues agree with me to ask the manager to go back and look at that, as well as direct the manager um, I know he's been hesitant to uh, talk about compensation for essential workers because of the noise that he anticipates he will hear. Um, but uh, just like I do and my colleagues do, we need to stand up for all of our town workers. And I just don't see her and I'm very upset. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, um, thank, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, and, and I will say, I'm not, I don't, I'm not gonna address that specifically. I, well, Mr. Chapdelaine, would you like to I simply wanted to acknowledge hearing everything that uh, Mrs. Mahan just shared. Um, I, I would, I do want to point out though, it's only contained in the first year because the statute only allows for the expenditures in the first year. Uh, if there were opportunities for extension of those benefits, I'd certainly be open to that, but no, certainly no insult was intended. It's just following the rules as they've been laid out by the federal government. Okay, th th thank you, Mr. Chapel. And, and I'm gonna turn it to, to other members. One thing I will say, and I think for all of these line items from, from what I heard from the manager at, at the beginning is, is this is the initial framework. All of the amounts are subject to change and revision as we move forward. And, and I will say that we're in an environment right now where back in May, May 17th to be exact, the treasury issued an interim final rule on guidance for how these funds should be spent. And there's a lot of um, requirements in there. And, and I think it's, it's, we're still in a stage where we're seeking clarification of the manager and town council are seeking clarification and we'd like to hear back from them. But for each of the, what I would call the four overall categories, and I'll get into this a little bit later when we talk about the, the, the various categories of expense, but there, there's guidance that is not final yet that puts limitations in terms of what can be done, how it can be spent and what's subject to audit. And I'd look to the town manager and town council to go through that carefully, come back to us in terms of what can be applied within those constraints. But um, let's turn it over to other members and, and we can have a further discussion on this as, as, as we go forward. Um, I'll turn now to Mr. Hurd. 
Thank you. So bear with me for a minute. So my questions are all written all over my page here. <clears throat> um, so I do want to address premium pay as well. Um, Mrs. Mahan was well said in just, you know, not I'm on the same page on the, the number and the desire to maximize the benefit for our town workers. Um, I had, I thank Mrs. Mahan for her research. I had a question as to wh where that number came from, whether or not it was the maximum allowable expense, what the maximum allowable would be and where we came up with the 1.5 million. So the maximum allowable for any pr premium pay for any essential worker, whether it be town or private, is not to exceed twenty-five thousand um, dollars. So that if we multiplied what we estimate would be eligible workers for town workers for the, the max, the twenty-five thousand dollar payment, that would be probably between five and seven million dollars. Um, what we did with that one point five million dollar figure is. Is, I don't know if Ms. Mahan's raising her hand. She, I, I, why don't you finish and then we can go around um, later on that, Mr. Chapter. Okay, thank you. Um, what we did was estimate what a one-time premium pay bonus payment might be for those we deem eligible or we think would be eligible under the statute. And some would be partially eligible. There's some employees who worked in person some of the time and not entirely in person. Um, and multiplied it by the amount of people that we think would be eligible. Okay. All right. And I would just, again, reiterate that for, for those listening and for this board and town manager that, you know, during, during the whole pandemic, if we look back, we seem now we're back out and about, but during the height of the pandemic, I did have a lot of conversations with our firefighters, our police department, DPW workers. And there was one that stuck out to me pretty clearly, and obviously won't use names, but there was a firefighter whose wife was pregnant at the time and was really, he was just, he didn't know what he should do. He wanted to be there for his wife, but he also had to work. And just the call out, not, not only were they working in person, this was, since no one else was on, on the road, no one there wasn't stores weren't open the call outs were responses to people that had COVID so there would be five firefighters and three police officers had to go into somebody's house that had COVID and you know give them medical assistance and facilitate their transfer to the medical facilities if that's what was want was worth it so I just think to illustrate that is this isn't just a bonus this is a bonus for people that we're out facing this incredible disease, this incredible virus, while we were all home and locked in our doors and getting our food delivered and cleaning our groceries with Clorox bleach. They were out face to face with the virus. So it's certainly warranted. So I would like to have to, and you know, I know that, again, this is a framework for dis discussion. These, are, these figures are being laid out before us so you can get our feedback. But I certainly would be interested in in looking at increasing that premium pay for our essential workers to the an amount that in again I'm not going to say what that amount is, but I think it is certainly a worthy cause and it's worth and that's one expenditure that's really important is to repay our workers for what they did during this incredible time. What in, in, it continues today. It's not over. <laughs> like they're still face to face with COVID patients, and even though we're all vaccinated, we know that not a, that there's breakthrough cases and there's still risks out there. And um, we're all taking a risk, and I think it, that needs to be a real consideration. And you did answer my other question about so by statute, as of right now, we can only do it in the first year. That's why it's only listed in the first year. Uh, sorry, I was off mute. Uh, yes, that's my understanding, and, and I, I think you know that could partially be because this statute passed at a time when we thought the pandemic was ending, mm -hmm. uh, and you know where we are today, I don't think was necessarily projected back in March, April, May of this year. So I, you know, I don't know whether updates will be made, but we can certainly 
you know, see whether or not there's any movement on the federal level in that regard. And I ha I, moving on, I have a comment about the revenue loss, which is just, I really ho I hope that we can get that changed, but it, but it seems insanity that we have this catch 22 where we can't recover revenue. We have specific revenue loss that we can attribute to the pandemic and we can't because we had a debt exclusion, which is just absurd. So, you know, I, so I know there's better men and women than me that are advocating for that change, but I certainly offer any services I can have to contact any state or local officials that we need to, because that is really essential. We've been to, ever since we've seen these funds and we have an impending override in the next few years, it's something that we need to take a look at. And if we can't fill that gap, it's gonna be a huge hit to the town. And so specifically on that item, in the event that we can't do, we can't um, use that for revenue loss, we have, I assume we'll have $5 million that we can reallocate amongst, amongst these categories. Correct. Yeah, that is accurate. Yep. Okay. Um, let's see this. Then on the HVAC, I know that's broadly across our town buildings. Can that be used for schools since the town technically owns? Because I know that's something I, I think most of the schools are now equipped with HVAC, but I believe there's still a few schools that are left over. And I do hear, hear a lot of complaints from school parents about HVAC. And, you know, with the climate crisis right now, school in June and September is uncomfortable. So that, I certainly would like to first allocate any HVAC funds that we have to make sure that all the schools have sufficient air conditioning so the kids don't have to sit in the heat in those warmer months. So just put, I know it will go across the, the whole fleet of buildings, but I just did want to say that. And I'm, again, I'm happy to hear the open space plan is specifically geared towards the playgrounds. I've gotten a few calls in the past weeks, as I'm sure others have about playgrounds that were suddenly shut down and decommissioned due to the state audit. So I think we have plenty of plenty of opportunities to invest in our playgrounds for our school children. So I would prioritize that in that particular category. All right, and then if we, just regarding the reserves, so we have an amount that's listed for reserves. What happens if we put money in reserve and we don't end up using it? Do we have a way to expend that? So I think what I would say is we, we would want to reallocate it before the end of the allocation period. Yeah. So, so we should so we, can, we, we shouldn't keep it in reserve forever. Yeah. So this is a rolling process where we can for, for the four year period, we can we can change how we allocate the funds as long as it falls within the, the guidance that's provided to us. All right. And with that, I would just say generally, it's, you know, I, I think we have some, a little work to do to rework some of these figures, but it's good to finally see some hard numbers and see what we can spend the money on because it, you, before this 35 million was sort of an arbitrary number, they almost felt imaginary, like, oh, they're just gonna get, tell us we have 35 and then they're gonna give us these guidelines that you can only spend 22 of it um, just to make the federal government seem like they, uh, they're they trying to help us out more than they actually are. But the fact, I wanna thank everyone that's put work into this to go through the guidelines, to allocate the funds and to try to make this a reality. So it's an exciting time and I think we can really do some good to recuperate some of the losses that people have had during COVID, but it also transition into some of the major goals that we've had in this town for a long time, particularly in affordable housing. But at the back end of this four years, as far as affordable housing, we're going to be in a much better position than we were four years ago. And that's an exciting time for Arlington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, uh, well, um, I'm all about the questions uh, more than the statements. 
Uh, and so my question, first question to you, uh, Mr. Chair, is uh, I have a bunch of questions, uh, but I would be happy to ask some of them later on. So after we hear from um, um, our residents, maybe will we be able to ask more questions? Sure. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, if you want to ask a few now, go right yeah. ahead and then yeah. we can. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask half of them now and then I'll save the other half for later on. Uh, so um, uh, has there been any consideration to coming up with a scoring um, mechanism for applications be so that maybe it, it, I may, I know for the first year, it might be a little difficult to do that in a timely way, but for I mean, the subsequent years, I mean, so that I mean, um, based on our goals, I mean, um, which we as a board can discuss and in, in conjunction with input from our residents, we I mean, have a way of, of as objectively as possible scoring the applications that come in so that it isn't a matter of I mean, the loudest voices in, um, getting what they want I mean that because we do that at the MPO the, the Metropolitan Planning Organization and, uh, and, and it's a complex um, scheme I mean, we, we spent a lot of time working on it but it really helps um, in evaluating um, projects that come in especially those that I may mean, have some synergies I mean, so uh, if we haven't thought about that I'll suggest that we do uh, uh, and like I said it may not be something we can do in this first year uh, but it's something that we could maybe implement in the second and third years. Um, so uh, that was, I guess, a question in the form, a statement in the form of a question. Uh, so has there any consideration of that, Mr. Um, 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 manager? Any three, Mr. Chair? So we have had some internal thought about that, and we have the model that we use for community development block grant funding that has a scoring uh, system that was initiated two or three budget seasons ago. I think we'd have to talk through what like, exactly how we would apply the scoring um, given the disparate categories. Um, you know, just thinking out loud, you know, would we score water and sewer? How would, you know, how do you score water and sewer as compared to homelessness prevention? Or how do you score water uh, HVAC improvements as opposed to investments in affordable housing? So we'd have to think about how to modify it in a section that has cross-cutting eligibility. Um, you know, across various, like pretty, again, disparate categories. But I, I think we can, if, if the board's will is such that we uh, develop something like that, I think it's something that we could readily do. Yeah, and, and sometimes what you have to do too, I mean, is, is just score within categories too. So if you have multiple um, applications in a pro in, within a category, then it gives you an objective way of choosing uh, uh, amongst them instead of it being a, a situation where the either be someone we like I mean, is advocating for it or people that we know I me mean, versus someone that we don't know. I mean, I think it's just a way of, of being um, a little more objective I mean, uh, in terms of how we select the project. So I'm glad to hear that there's been a little bit of thought on that. Uh, so um, second, with respect to um, supporting artists, I mean, and this is where I mean, the story might come into play because we can support artists, we can support housing, but if there were a plan that supported housing artists and housing, it'd be like, well, almost a bingo. Um, and so I think we'd like to encourage I mean, um, applications or, or ideas that, that would do both help artists uh, who need housing, you know? So, um, and so along those lines, I was, yeah, I just put that out. I guess that's once again, more of a statement, but uh, I guess more of a suggestion that we try to find some synergies in when it comes to helping artists, which I'm all for. It'd be really great if we could help artists with respect to housing, you know, uh, and so that's the second point. Uh, uh, so, um, with respect to food insecurity um, with within Arlington, um, that's um that's an interesting one. It because uh, we um I I really support the the work done by Food Link being and and um, Arlington Eats being, and I guess to a certain extent, we're not really clear how much more insecurity there is, but we do know there is, we, um, and we know there is being in, in the region. Uh, and we, I think there's a lot of potential here we, um, for us to be help with insecurity we, uh, across the region while also making sure that we increase the, um, I, let me, I, I think I might have spoken, that we take care of the food needs across the region, I mean, uh, and also find um, 
make sure that there is less insecurity here because I think sometimes it's hard to really uh, find that insecurity because people are often, I think, um, reluctant to reveal that. So I like to see um, with the monies that we give uh, to those who entities uh, effort on a greater effort on that. And so um, the, the last of mine for now, um, water rate, um, the, the sewer and um, water and sewer. Uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate the fact that it can help uh, reduce water rates. And so I have one, a couple of questions. One is, is I imagine that lower income people are more affected by the, the water rates than, than higher income people. There's no like discount program or anything for low income people with respect to housing. I mean, with respect to water. Is there Mr. Um, Mr. So the board did adopt uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago, a senior low income water right. rate program. So it doesn't, it wouldn't benefit all low income people in the community, but seniors who would qualify. Right. And so I mean, might it be possible for us to also do a water conservation um, program I mean, in this context too? I mean, like still do the, the water and sewer, but also come up with a program to help people um, um, conserve water. Uh, um, would that fit into this? I would imagine it, it would. Um, and I think yeah. that's something I can, I can bring back to, to DPW and see what they All think right. that might, might look like. All right, that's it for now. I might have three more later on. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Diggins. And before I turn it to Mr. Helmut, just one thing you had asked about food insecurity and, and this might be more, well, I'm not gonna call it anecdotal, but in the Arlington Eats had sent us a letter and in their request for funding. And they did say that they're serving a third of the number of residents who are at risk of being food insecure in Arlington. They had increased the number of families from 165 families pre-pandemic to 250 families per week. And then they went on to say that that's serving only about a third of the number um, that who are at risk of being food insecure. And again, it's not um, it maybe all of the data that, that um, it isn't precise in terms of, of what that, that that number is, but it was in, in that letter. Um, before, you, and again, sir. before I turn to Mr. Hamlet, Mr. Hurd, you would put your hand up in the middle of Mr. Diggins's um, question. I don't know if you had something that yeah, I didn't know might it, be relevant to the question he had, and then I'll turn it to Mr. Hamlet. Yeah, sorry, I, I'll be brief. I, I was just gonna say, as far as the, the numbering system for, we have a, for a community development block grant, but under CBG, the very specific categories. So we might get 11 requests and eight of them are all part of a very specific category. So that's why we have to number them. So it is like the, the manager said, it's difficult in, in where these requests don't go to a general category that we have a limit. So we'll have a limit on affordable housing with CDBG. We'll have a limit on other categories. So that's why we have to number them it would be difficult to just put it out so, you know how do you like he said put put a number on homelessness and affordable housing versus water rates but so it's a, it's a it's a little more difficult i think in this framework but that's all and then i was going to address the, the food insecurity okay. thing, but i think mr chair took care of that okay thank you thank you mr hurd mr helmuth yeah, thank you. And no problem. As far as I'm concerned, the more time I have to listen to my more senior colleagues, the better. So uh, I'm, I'm glad for those, uh, those additions. Um, I have a few questions. I'm really curious what the, the public thinks as well. I do want to say I really appreciate this framework. I know that it's preliminary. I know that we don't know the final rules, and that's hard. I know that there are competing worthy priorities. Um, and, you know, I'm glad to hear my colleagues' thoughts about those tonight. Uh, too. But I, I want to thank the town manager for the thought that has gone into this. Um, and this requires a lot of forward thinking as well. And I think that's the spirit of the legislation um, in a lot of ways is to really think about our vulnerable uh, community members. And, uh, you know, and, and from a number of angles, this, this I think, has some real meaning uh, for, for those kinds of investments. So, um, you know, I think that this discussion is healthy. We will fine tune it. Uh, I'm certainly open to such as, to doing that. I think that's what's going to happen anyway. Um, but just just a kudos because I think that it's it seems like a lot of money until you realize that it really isn't 
because the need is so big and the constraints are so so severe. So, you know, I think that um, you know I appreciate the work that's gone into it so far, and and the fairness that it represents. Um, just a few questions on the on the HVAC. Um, to what extent, if any, does this contemplate making the kind of uh, ventilation improvements that might uh, really improve air exchanges per hour or, or in institute the kind of filtration that could, um, could, that could deal with viral particles. And I'm far from an expert on this, but I guess, you know, I'm thinking that this is not going to be the last pandemic. And so, you know, I know that those kinds of changes are pretty expensive, but, um, you know, is that something that could be on the menu or have you, you know, look into this at all for, for those kinds of improvements in town buildings? My current understanding is that that is the exact type of investment that the statute contemplates mm -hmm. uh, is is improving the indoor air quality of all types of buildings, including municipal and school buildings. So I, I think um, you know every building will have a different strategy and solution, but I think making investments as appropriate as you've described are you know completely eligible under this funding source. And. Um... Yeah, and of course we have a brand new high school building that will be very up to date on those standards, which is which is great to protect our, our kids there. Uh, have you tried to do an analysis, or do you plan to do an analysis of what the potential need is for particularly some of the older buildings? With uh, and, and just to to evaluate, is this enough money, and, and you know to to do what what we have the opportunity to do? So I I think the facilities department has a pretty good handle on what the need. Mm -hmm. is I haven't seen or asked for yet a, a number associated with you know various air quality improvements or ventilation improvements across the fleet. Mm -hmm. But I think from everything they learned over the course of the past 18 months in making um, you know some permanent, some temporary uh, improvements to the air quality or the, the HVAC units throughout the, the building fleet, I think they have a pretty good, pretty good sense of what those investments could be and could put together. I mean, let me say it a different way. I think we could figure out a way to spend that $2.7 million very quickly. And very effectively, and you know, we probably will have to have discussions about whether or not any potentially excess funding, you know, goes to a category like that. Yeah, great. Yeah, I would I would encourage us to just keep an eye on that because um, just thinking about the future, um, that um, we it would certainly be a benefit to be able to really safeguard the building, the air quality as best we can. You know, we we learned with COVID that the airborne nature of it was not no, was not apparent to science at the beginning, but we really learned that that's, that's, that's really huge with it. So this will probably not be the last pathogen to which that applies. Uh, I also wanna echo Mr. Hurd's appreciation of the parks and playgrounds investment. And I just wanna add to that, that it, you know, in addition to just the out and out safety issues there, that, that the parks and the playgrounds are, have an important public health purpose um, with respect to pandemic. And we saw this you know, early on and continue to see this, that providing good safe recreation spaces in our athletic fields, parks, playgrounds, you know, all of those, the need is huge. I know this from my past role with CPA money that uh, we are just treading water there. And uh, it would be great to be able to catch up and not have to fund playgrounds when they get, when they get, um, when the stuff breaks and is no longer safe. So not have to wait that long would be wonderful. So thank you for that. Um, you know, likewise, I think the investments in housing are really, are really appealing. We often have, have said, I think all of us and mean it that we really care about investing in affordable housing. And it's very difficult with the affordable housing trust, which is a great new vehicle. Um, it's, it's hard to make, um, to get that ball rolling and to actually spend the money. It's always harder, right? But I think this is another opportunity. So I'm really glad to see that in there. And, um, you know, I might look at the housing category as, as one of those overflow places where if we have, if we are regrettably not able to do general fund relief, which I very much hope we can, and thank you for those efforts, uh, you know, that might be another area uh, where we could contemplate, you know, potentially some some increasing as well as, the, as, well as the food insecurity. And I would, uh, Mr. DeCourcy took, took the words out of my mouth with Foodlink, you know, their, their service went through the roof during the, um, during the, the, the pandemic and that need is not faded. And there's, there's much more that we can do. So again, the theme of, of helping our most vulnerable, um, I think, you know, there's a lot to like here and a lot of opportunity there as well. The final thing I would, I would ask, and I don't want answers for this now, but just to give you an idea how I'm thinking, you know, is that I, I appreciate uh, my two colleagues' comments about premium pay, and I want to know more about that. I'd like, I think for me to understand this, I would, 
in another setting, and this could be you know offline or another meeting, I'd like to understand how we got to where we got with the, the current proposed amount in the framework, what that represents sort of per person. Um, and, and, and I just need to learn more about what the statutory intent you know, for, uh, for that is. And, and maybe it'd be helpful to have an understanding of sort of per employee average, you know, uh, what, the, what this looks like then versus the max. Um, and just kind of what the thinking went into that I want to, you know, I want to be sure that um, that the town manager has a chance to to explain that. Um, and and I you know I appreciate the town manager's openness to listening as well. If if the board feels like we want to we want to boost that, I just feel like I need to understand more about the details and about how we got there. You know where 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 we could get. Um, I might be interested, frankly, in understanding uh, how the other municipalities are addressing premium pay. Um, we don't have to do what they do. They may not be giving enough either. I, I don't know. So that, that, don't under, misunderstand my words, but I, I think it's always useful to see um, what other communities are doing so that we can learn from that. And we maybe we conclude that we need to do more than they're doing. You know, maybe we find out we are, I, you know, I, again, I don't know, but these are some of the questions I have. I'm, I'm open to, you know, anything at this point, open to the wisdom of the community, um, to my colleagues, but, um, I think getting some more of those specifics would help me develop a position on that as well. And uh, so I'm still listening on that issue. Uh, but that's, thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm okay, good. and I'm gonna open it up to the public in just a moment, just a couple of comments that I have before we get there. And I'll have more to say after the public speaks, but in terms of the, the various categories, and, and one thing I, I talked about with the town manager about this earlier, there are essentially four categories. So one of the categories has a part A and part B, which is respond to the health, public health emergency or its negative economic impacts. Premium pay is a separate category. Revenue loss is a separate category. And infrastructure improvements actually has two parts, water and sewer and broadband. And what I'd like to see from a, a future table from the, from the town manager, if it's possible, is to, to break out these categories within each of the four. So we, we identify, and that may help in some areas in terms of scoring things, but I certainly support using funds for all four. And, and another thing I, I would like to, to hear from the town manager, not this evening, but um, going forward is who is being identified as, a, as an essential worker and to the extent that you've done an analysis already in terms of any limitations contained in the interim final rule, I think it would help be helpful for us and for the community to know what those limitations are, if any. Um, I know that the interim final rule came out on May 17th, it's 40 pages long. It covers each one of the areas. And, and I think we've looked at the statute, the, the statute clearly provides for premium pay for essential workers, but there are other limitations that have come out. Um, and and I, think, I think it would be important to, to get that out there on the table, but it also would be important for us to know what workers you've identified as, as, as essential workers um, in terms of developing the amount as well. So um, with that, I am through a show of hands, we have some participants, um, perhaps we can take some public comment and then come back for any comments for the board. Before I do that, did you wanna say anything in response to that, Mr. Chapdelaine or? Uh, no, no, I've just been taking, taking notes uh, and I, I think all those requests are very reasonable. Okay, all right, so, so if, Again, on, on ARPA funding, American Rescue Plan Act, if there's anybody who wishes to be heard, why don't we start on, on the list there? Um, the first hand is Steve Moore. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry it took a while for everything to uh, load up. Um, uh, I, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. I'd like to uh, uh, thank the town manager for providing the broad framework um, with uh, uh, many, many competing interests because that is what we need to do with funds that are, um, are provided to round some of the hard edges of the town's budget program. I, uh, I, I have to say, though, I, I was um, disheartened by, by some of uh, Ms. Mahan's comments, um, uh, which I will charitably call um, 
distinguishing characteristics about the various groups and towns and interests uh, related to these funds. Um, I have to say drawing, well, distinction isn't, drawing lines between uh, uh, essential workers and non-essential, union and non-union, highly paid and not highly paid workers in town, I don't think is helping uh, the issues that, that we have. Uh, it, it strikes me as unfortunately rather parochial and, 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 and one-sided. One I think with this unexpected funding, we need to make sure that we cover a lot of interests, not just one particular uh, narrow, relatively narrow set of interests. And, and I just was, uh, was disheartened to hear those comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Okay. It's Beth Locke. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry. I hope you I hope you can hear oh, no me. Problem. Great. Yep. Go, go ahead, Ms. Locke. I'm toggling back and forth between phone and uh, computer. So um, my name is Beth Locke. I'm the executive director of the um, Arlington Chamber of Commerce and um, joining tonight's meeting just to sort of catch up on. Um, I haven't been able to attend earlier meetings. I'm, I'm pleased to see the allocation towards business. Um, and but I'm, I, I noticed that there hasn't been much discussion from the board on those particular on the line item allocated to business. So I would like to advocate for business and say, um, you know, as we get further down the line, if we um, I think, you know, it's important that everyone understand that this community has been very adversely affected by the pandemic and that the um, the quality of our businesses and the livelihood of our businesses um, and the strength of our main street is important to the town as much as many of these other items that are being discussed. So um, Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. the chamber is hosting a state of a town event um, at which um, Mr. Chapdelaine and Mr. DeCourcy will be joining us as well as the um, folks from the community and planning development department. And I just, I just would like you all to keep the business community top of mind as you, as you continue to make these decisions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Luck. And speaking for Mr. Chapdelaine, we are looking forward to the state of the town um, meeting with the chamber and, and uh, certainly to talk about some ideas and, and receive input from the chamber members as well that day. Great, we're looking forward to it too. Thank you. Great, thank you. Robert Dustin is next. Good evening, Mr. Dustin. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, president of local 1297, the Firefighters Union. Um, I appreciate you uh, hearing me out tonight. So just really quickly on the essential workers pay, um, everyone at the fire department has you know, shown up, You know, not to say no one's complained, but uh, We've gone out and done our job every day, every call. Um, you know, as everything changed and it was very scary in the beginning, still scary, but less so now. Um, wasn't one time a guy refused to go into a house, help someone, um, people with COVID, people unknown. Um, as Ms. Mahan said, you know, we had guys who have uh, wives who were pregnant at the time, um, young children at home. I still have young unvaccinated children who are, uh, aren't are eligible currently. Um, we still go do it. We still go do a job. And um, some of that money was specifically earmarked from us, for us by the president. And I understand you've made a line item for that. Uh, we were also told you're gonna negotiate it with us and you set the limit on the money already, which doesn't seem like you plan to negotiate with us. It's, seems more like you plan to just give us an amount that you thought was appropriate. So we're asking today that 
you raise the amount of the line item, not necessarily to give it to us all, but to reflect the fact that through discussion, it's possible to get it. We just don't want to see it closed off before we have a chance to discuss it. Um, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dustin. The next name is Beth Malofchik. Good evening, Ms. Malofchik. Hi. Malofchik. Uh, <laughs> Russell Street, I apologize for my dog that has COPD. Um, I would like to thank Ms. Mahan for um, prioritizing the first responders. And I would like to um, thank and applaud Mr. Dustin for speaking out on, um, yeah, just a, <laughs> what's, I think what's self, uh, well, it's a really important issue. And that is that those first responders and uh, specifically the uh, firemen who we knew very little about this disease, except that it was deadly, um, showed up for their job and did their job. And um, as a resident, really, really thankful for that. Um, thankful for Ms. Mahan's continued advocacy for these essential um, workers and very important um, professions in town without which it would, the community would find it really hard to exist. And, um, I would like teachers in there. Maybe I'm missing something. And I admit that I'm not that knowledgeable on ARPA. Maybe they're covered somewhere else. But I think that the teachers faced a lot in the very beginning. And so that perhaps some part of the reserve, if you haven't already got something for teachers, I think that's essential. They had to like create something out of nothing when when this whole thing came down and school was closed and online and whatever. I'll end there on that one. I'd, I'd like to thank Ms. Mahan for confirming that it is a $24,000 benefit that the town manager receives for living in Arlington. And I'd just like to add that I believe he no longer lives in Arlington. So I'd ask- it, that, no, so Ms. Malovchuk, just on that point, and, and I know that, that that issue has come back before, for, but if we can just keep the ARPA funding on your comments. Right, well, comments relating to comments on ARPA funding. Um, uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Helmuth for bringing forth the HVAC and air quality issue. That's essential. That should really be prioritized. Not only air conditioning, yes, all schools need that. It's apparent from climate change, but the air quality, the transference, I think Mr. Helmuth mentioned what the quality was. Anyway, that should be essential, particularly for schools, all, you know, obviously for any workplace these days, but absolutely for schools. Um, open space, you know, I'm a big advocate on open space. So I, I totally endorse that. I think that's essential. And we've learned during this pandemic how essential to mental health and well being our green spaces are. So, um, yeah, I think I hit everything. And again, thanks to Ms. Mahan and thanks to Mr. Dustin from the fire department for um, being front and center as he does every day. And, and I just, I'm appreciative the community wouldn't exist without um, men and women like him. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Ms. Malefchuk. And I'm sorry about your dog. That sounds like he's having a tough night tonight, but um, okay. Is there anybody else, Mr. Chapdelaine? There are no other hands raised at this time. Okay, all right. So what I what I think I'll, I'll do is, I think some board members had reserved questions or comments until after the public spoke. So I will go through the list again, and then we, um, we'll, we'll, we'll move forward. So um, I'll come back to Mrs. Mahan. Any further questions or comments? Oh, just need to, we need you to mute your, unmute your microphone. There we go. I think is that they, working? Yes, now it is. Okay, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Um, I, I guess I would um, 
just stress again my main point uh, around essential workers. Um, the manager <clears throat> did say he would, um, even though he left them out of the categories that apply, and I think they're in the top three. Um, having met with one of the six unions and putting the number out, and to me it's a it's really pittance kind of number. And I, I only brought up about the housing allowance that this board has demonstrated that we need to um, uh, respect and keep important workers and, and reciprocate that. And I just want to continue that uh, tradition of the housing allowance, the hybrid remote working for non-union employees. And um, I know the manager quoted five to seven million, it's five million if we did the math, which would be about 6,000 to 6,700 a year for our essential workers. So um, I really hope that at least two, if not three, or all of my colleagues um, at the end of the day agree with me on that. And to Mr. Helmut's point, um, I wish we <clears throat> could speak about this, but I have to make sure we don't do sort of an illegal quorum kind of thing. Um, and, and I have had conversations with the manager and the chair. So um, I'll have to find another way. Maybe someone else can speak with you because I don't want to violate our, our uh, open meeting law forum. But I, I just want to say, and I know it's, some people may kind of bristle at this, but I'm really insulted. If it's a one-time allocation we can only give, then let's give the max the one time that we can give it. And that would be about 13 to six, 13 to 14.75% of these monies allocated. It's not 7 million, it's 5 million if we do the max. So I'd ask the manager to be more truthful on that, be more truthful on negotiating with the unions because you haven't. You haven't met with any of them. You say, ask me, that's news to me, but there's six unions involved. And um, just as I advocate for the town manager and keeping him here, because um, he's a, a, a professional and we need him here, and advocate for our non-union M schedule employees to work hybrid remote and get top baseline pay, I just wanna do the same thing for our, our union employees. So I'm, I know I'm very passionate about it. I know one speaker took offense to that, I'm not going to apologize for that because I advocate for all town employees. Um, so uh, I hope some of my colleagues can join me on that in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I think most of my questions were addressed before. Um, and, you know, I'll definitely follow up with the town manager to kind of work on some of these numbers and some of the areas that I had talked about before. I do want to address, I apologize to Ms. Locke, Mrs. Locke from the Chamber of Commerce. We, I should have mentioned the businesses because we cert, that's certainly an important item and I always try to be an advocate for local businesses. And I know serving on the Economic Advisory Task Force that there were gaps in the previous funding that we received from the federal government. And there's definitely a need where some of that funding has ran out for businesses. So I am very happy to see that in there and look forward to working with the businesses to allocate those funds as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm glad I held back because some of the things I was going to say have been addressed by others. Uh, so uh, a question um, to whomever can answer this. And, um, so the state has funds to spend Yes, no? Correct, they do. They do. Do we have a sense of when we're going to get, um, well, do we have a sense when we're, we're going to find out how they allocate their funds? The sad answer is no. Okay. Um, they've really struggled to figure out where they were going to invest their funds. Um, so I'd be hard pressed to actually give a, a real timeline. Yeah, well, no, no, no is an answer. You know, so it's, um, we will probably find out something in the next year. So that will affect maybe what we do um, in year two, three of our, um, of our uh, choices. Uh, and uh, a request is, is can um, we get the, at least the text that, or the guidelines that you're using for the limitations on how the funds or spend. I mean, I could go out and research it my, myself, but to the extent I mean, you're working with some set 
of um, guidelines. I mean, uh, it'd be great if um, we could get those so that I mean, I know how to limit, frame my thinking about things you know, and also explain it to people um, when they ask me why we're making the choices that we're making. So I very much appreciate that. And um, let's see. Oh, um, and uh, the affordability for housing, uh, that's for rentals, right? I would think it would end up being rentals. I suppose it could apply to home ownership or rentals, but I think in most instances, yeah, affordable housing comes in the form of um, rental housing in this town. Okay. Just making sure. I mean, I thought that was the case too. I just wanted to make sure. And finally, uh, I will say uh, uh, to in response to Ms. Locke, uh, Ms. Locke talking about um, the um, state of the town. And I used to record those when I was working with AC ACMI, and I love recording them. Uh, you learn so much about what's going on. You know, not only do I have a conflict uh, this time, but also I think it might be a little. I mean, I'm a little concerned about open meeting laws, and, and so I'm not going to attend myself. But I really encourage people uh, to attend. I mean, the the business community um, is a really great community. And what's really good about the community here is that it's mostly small businesses. I mean, and a lot of them are are residents in town. I mean, and you really get to um, it's a way to get to know uh, uh, the other your, your fellow residents who help to make the town a better place. So I encourage you to listen in, and I hope ACMI is going to record it because I'll watch it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. And, and just on the, the interim final rule, and, and we can work with the town manager and, and town council on that, but that that we can have that distributed to all members. There were also frequently asked questions of the Treasury Department. And while it doesn't rise to the level of rules, it does give some examples. And I think that might be helpful for members as well. And again, everybody's not expected to know that inside and out. We're gonna to look to the manager and look to, to town council on that in terms of framing what some of the limitations are. And it, and it applies to all categories. It's not just, just one category, but it does elaborate. And as I said, they haven't become final rules yet, but they, they have been published now for a few months. Um, so with that, uh, we'll turn to Mr. Helmut. Thank you. There's uh, one question I forgot on my list. I forgot to ask um, an earlier, and this is kind of a small one. Um, but as the select board is designated to the new newly formed remote participation study committee, which was a committee to town meeting voted to set up uh, following the select board's recommendation, following the citizen petition um, to to look at needs and opportunities for town bodies, boards, commissions, com and, and 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 such committees to be able to employ remote meeting, particularly hybrid meeting technologies, so that even sort of, if there isn't gonna be an after the pandemic when things are safer to be together, that we could have an, a, an ongoing expanded capacity for remote citizen participation, whether that's people with business before a board or just wanna comment. Um, so the committee will be convening this month and we're gonna get right to work on that. Uh, my question is, I think I saw some of this in the federal guidelines, but have we, as being a potentially eligible expense to kind of ex expand this kind of infrastructure? And I wonder if the, uh, the town manager could, could confirm that. And also uh, if we've contemplated that, you know, I, I don't think these are gonna be enormous expenses on the scale of some of what's on the table now on, on the spreadsheet now, but you know, there would be some, some technology costs, one-time technology costs, maybe some level of staffing costs um, to contemplate. So, you know, is is are, are the ARPA funds potentially a source for that kind of investment? Should we be able to put together some program? Mr. Chairman, yeah, um, to through you to Mr. Helmuth, yes, I believe you are correct that those costs would be eligible. Um, and if it seems like the board would be desirous of it. I could build that into a framework to bring back before the board. And I think I agree with you that though not insignificant, I don't think they would be large in comparison to the other categories currently delineated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just finally, and, and this is really optional on the part of the town manager, and I think at the chair's discretion, but you know, I think anytime that there is a concern that our town manager has not been honest with us, I want to make sure that that's not an issue of just miscommunication and misunderstanding because that can happen to, between good people. Um, but with respect to meeting with the unions to dis discuss this, um, Mr. Chair, is there anything, is there an opportunity, we wanna give the uh, town manager an opportunity to kind of clarify uh, the reason behind what he told us tonight and his understanding of kind of what, what did or didn't happen? 
Sure, Mr. Chaplain, if you'd like that opportunity. Sure, I mean, I, I can say uh, like unequivocally, I've sat down with the leadership and asked me to have preliminary discussions about this. Um, there's, that is 100% truth. Um, it, it hasn't moved forward to putting pen to paper or having any agreements. I don't think I claimed that, but um, I, I mean, I absolutely have had conversations with that union. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, and I think finally, I want to say, I want to appreciate the, uh, the firefighter who spoke to us tonight. First of all, to express my profound appreciation for, uh, for public safety workers who absolutely did, without question, put themselves in harm's way. They do that every day, but I think that COVID really gave them a, uh, a new understanding, a new appreciation of, the, appreciations of the risk that not only they are taking, but their families are taking. And, and that matters to me. Um, and, and my gratitude is, is real. And I thought, you know, those are, those are really important points. And I look forward to, you know, continuing those discussions. Um, and I appreciate the town manager's, you know, good faith um, effort in that. I know that he is a good listener. Um, I have perceived him to be a fair person. And, you know, I think we can continue to have an honest discussion. We may have different priorities. We may have different needs. There's a lot of different priorities that, that compete that we need to balance. Um, but, you know, I hope we can move forward constructively and, and, and assuming the best intent on all sides. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. And, and yeah, I also want to recognize firefighter Dustin for his comments, because I, one of the things that struck me um, at the beginning of the pandemic and, and had the habit at the end of each day of just taking a walk and, and coming down Mass Ave, no one would be on Mass Ave. And, and one week very early on in particular, the rescue truck came down Mass Ave one night and came down the next night. No one was on the road. People, I was the only one walking and you knew what the firefighters were going to. I mean, it's highly likely they were going to, to a COVID call and it, and it really is a memory that um, it was really etched in my mind. And, and I, 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 I can still you know, picture that, that eerie feeling of, of seeing it go down and then not knowing, feeling for them, not knowing what they were getting, getting into. So I, I want to thank the town manager for the for the presentation tonight. He has laid out a timetable through October 13th. I, I think there are a number of questions that have arisen tonight, just in terms of I think some members probably want to do a little bit more research on 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 different aspects. I think people may want an opportunity to reach out individually to the town manager um, to talk to him about uh, you know maybe maybe different concerns before we come back together as a group. Um, so what I'm thinking is let's let's hold October 13th as a date, but it, it, unless you tell me otherwise, Mr. Chapdelaine, I, I, I'm not sure, you know, we may need another night of discussion before there's an endorsement here. And I, and I think that process here is important and in, in getting clarification and, and um, taking a look at things so that we're all on the same page, at least as to what the, what the scope of, of various categories are. Um, so I don't know if you have any comments on that. If, if October 13th is a, I, I know we wanted to do this by the end of September, but I'm just, I think next week's meeting's too soon to come back. And I, and I think um, this gives you an opportunity to take a look at things to um, consider what was said tonight. It also gives the members an opportunity to maybe take a further look at various categories because there are other categories that we didn't discuss that I think is certainly are, are worthy of discussion. So in response to that, um, uh, yeah, I think that's very prudent. Um, I, I think it, it feels to me like having another discussion, whether it be for endorsement or not on the 13th would likely be very beneficial. And um, in moving to then, uh, what is it, the 26th, um, not 25th, would be the next meeting. I think you know holding that for potential endorsement makes sense. But I, I think overall, your point is well taken that we're still in a period of time where getting this right is more important than getting it done. If that makes sense, so I, I think what you've laid out um, is is a very wise path. Okay, and and one point you touched on it a little bit earlier in the meeting um, on the homelessness issue about the need for maybe a regional discussion. And, and I, I see that in the area of mental health support as well. I mean, we're doing, AYCC is really stretched and, and glad to see that there are funds being provided there. But I, I'm wondering between now and in the next meeting and maybe not part of 
what your framework is, but what categories here can we look to maybe a regional approach to, to try to, whether it's with the state or with other communities to try to um, you know, work, work together in the region to, to, to improve much needed services. Are you, are you asking me right now? Um, I, I, well, I'm, I'm trying, I, I don't know if you have a response to that. I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. Homelessness is certainly one of them. Behavioral health um, can certainly be one, you know, especially from a provider point of view and being able to recruit and retain uh, behavioral health or mental health providers. You know, some of the other bigger ones, HVAC, parks and playgrounds, water, sewer, not, not so much because we maintain our own systems, our own ecosystems, same with premium pay, it's our own employee set revenue loss for obvious reasons. Um, but I think even if it's not a regional approach, we can learn from others and based on what they're doing, right? It's, if someone else has a, a unique or innovative approach to HVAC, we can we can draft off that and same for water sewer, same for parks and playgrounds and so on and so forth. So nothing else jumps out at me for true partnership, but I think, I think being tuned into what's happening in the region makes sense as we can continue. All right. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine. So I, I think on the presentation, maybe a, a motion to receive Mr. Chapdelaine's report uh, is in order. I think that's the only um, so, item before the board. So uh, we have a motion by Mr. Hurd. Do we have a second? Second. A second by Mr. Helmuth. Okay, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Um, with my point of concern, yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Okay, thank you, Attorney Heim. So next is on the agenda is open forum, except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. I just want to point out that we have a tree hearing after this. We will be taking public comment on the tree hearing. So if you would like to speak about the proposed removal of trees in Broadway, you'll have the opportunity to do that during agenda item three. Um, so with that, I will open up the open forum if there's anybody. There's one hand raised uh, by Beth Malofchik. Okay. Good evening again, Ms. Malofchuk. Hi, I, um, I just wanted to express my concern with the approaching override for $40 million and look forward to hearing at presumably at some point how the select board and town management will be addressing um, what appears to be overspending and how uh, moving forward that will be uh, remediated. And um, I am curious as to, it was mentioned in prior remarks this evening that the M class was um, generously compensated during COVID. So I'm curious where that information could be located. Um, I, um, yeah, those are my comments for open forum. Beth Malofchek, Russell Street, town meeting member. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Malofchek. Welcome. One other hand has been raised by Martin Conroy. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Conroy. Hi, good evening. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Martin Conroy, uh, the secretary, Local 1297. Uh, I just wanted to echo um, President Dustin's uh, remarks. Um, we also wanted to thank uh, Selectman uh, Mahans um, for her uh, words of encouragement and support, as well as uh, the rest of the um, uh, select board. Um, again, just wanted to reiterate, you know, we um, uh, just on behalf of my members, you know, they did show up for work every day. They were prepared. Um, they were ready and, and uh, willing to do anything that we're, they were called upon. 
And uh, I think we'd be remiss just if we didn't uh, mention it as well as our uh, brothers and sisters on the police department. They were also, um, just like Mr. DeCourcy said, you know, as the rescue was going up and down Mass Ave, they were also right there in the thick of things. Um, thank you very much tonight. Uh, we do understand that there's a lot of competing interests. We're, uh, we're appreciative of the fact that uh, you all have the tough cho uh, choices to make. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Conroy. All right, well, that will conclude. I believe that concludes open forum. No one else is on the list, Mr. Chaplain. Uh, correct, there's no other hands okay. raised. All right, item three, proposed removal of trees, Broadway Plaza project. And people remember last week, we um, this was on our agenda, but due to time constraints, what we did is we uh, considered the three trees that were above the MWRA easement, which we approved. There are nine trees that are proposed for removal. And um, I will turn it over to Mr. Rademacher, the Director of Public Works and, and the Town Manager for the presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Select Board. I, um, I'm here tonight uh, as um, the Chairman stated, uh, looking for approval to remove uh, nine trees uh, associated with the reconstruction and rehabilitation of, of Broadway Plaza. Uh, as you all know, we recently completed a, a sidewalk project in the area last summer. Uh, Broadway Plaza was originally proposed to be completed at that same time. And we then learned that the MWRA had work beneath the plaza surface, which caused us to delay that portion of the project. Um, fortunately for the town, the MWRA is going to assume some of the costs in reconstructing uh, the plaza surface, approximately three quarters of the cost, so uh, about $300,000. So the delay, while unfortunate uh, financially, is, is going to help the town. But I would like to speak more about these trees, obviously. Uh, throughout the design of this project, it was obvious that the brick surface was failing and it is a, an impediment to um, pedestrians and, and folks with mobility um, uh, difficulties. And similar to the sidewalks, we we're gonna replace these bricks with the concrete surface. Unfortunately, a lot of the trees out here have their roots have severe, uh, are the cause of why these bricks are no longer a um, adequate uh, walking surface. They're heaving the roots, uh, heaving the bricks significantly to the point where they uh, are, are, are fairly a significant hazard. And, and, they're, and they're right at the surface of the, of the plaza as well. These are roots that as soon as we take the, the bricks away, I, I feel we're going to be unearthing these roots and uh, the construction is going to be causing some serious harm to these trees, which, which are already showing signs of significant stress. I, I spoke with a few arborists and uh, landscape architects and the and the and the size of the the canopy on these trees for the age the fact that there's a lot of sucker growth um, small branches being shot out from the, the tree trunks themselves um, and the fact that they really haven't shown any significant growth over the past several years indicates that these trees are under stress and, and we're we're afraid that the construction isn't going to allow them to continue to be uh, healthy trees. The proposed project will replace nine of the 12 trees at the plaza. And the construction that we're proposing with these new trees is a uh, more modern approach to urban tree planting where we will supplement the soil beneath the this plaza surface with what's called a structural soil. It allows for healthy root growth in an urban environment where soil compaction is a problem. Uh, it is, we're using it in other areas along Mass Ave. We used it on the sidewalk project last year with great success so far, knock on wood. And what this will do is allow the trees we plant to, to have a better chance of success greater than the trees that are, are there today. And my concern about trying to preserve any of the, these trees that we have now, in addition to not allowing us to build a an ADA compliant surface, walking surface, is we lose the opportunity to amend the soil beneath the surface of the plaza once it's constructed. So not planting new trees now will severely hamper our ability to plant trees in the future in a, in a manner that will provide for their greatest success moving forward. 
so we have we, we have given a ton of consideration to these trees I, I don't don't take it lightly um, the request to remove them uh, it's not frequent that public works uh, looks to do this kind of uh, work with trees we, we spend most of our time planting and saving and pruning trees and it's just an unfortunate um, circumstance that in order to get a nicer downtown plaza with with a tree canopy that I am confident in the future will far exceed the one we have today um, that's why I'm here requesting for the removal of these trees okay Thank you, Mr. Rademacher. I, I don't know if the members have received the proposed plans, but I don't know if Mr. Chapter it's possible to, to share that screen in terms of what is being proposed and, and what the trees that are identified for removal. I, oh, okay, great. Is that like does this show the trees identified for removal or just the new trees? These is just this is the proposed layout. If I could share my screen, I think I could show the the tree plan. Okay. Let me give you that permission. And uh, hopefully I do this right. All right, you should be able to share your screen now, Mike. Can you all see this? Yes. Yeah, you might want to zoom in a little bit. Sure. This um, this first plan is simply the Mass Ave corridor with Broadway Plaza, showing all the trees that were either existing or planted. Um, when we did the sidewalk project, we we planted fourteen new trees and lost one healthy tree for safety reasons, and removed two, I believe, um, unhealthy dying trees. So we had a significant gain um, on that sidewalk project alone. Uh, so that's what this first plan is. And this next um, it, this next plan is, is a blow up of the plaza. So the blue X's are the trees that we are, that are in question tonight. The yellow X's are the trees that were within the MWRA's utility work. I would note that- Okay, and, and of the trees there, and sorry, Mr. Ronemarker, the four darker trees are four existing trees that you're proposing to keep at the site. That's correct. Uh, about a, a year, it was around December or February of last year um, of 2020, uh, we had some discussions with the tree committee about this project. And at the time, the project proposed to keep two trees at the corner of Medford and Mass Ave and through discussions with um, members of the tree committee and others, the consultant and, and others, we also elected to attempt to retain the two trees along Mass Ave closer to the Broadway intersection. Okay, and and just if you could, before I turn it to members, what what is the proposed timing for the removal and replacement of these of the nine trees? They, I believe, they do not need to be removed until the MWRA's contractor begins the restoration work, which would be next spring, early spring. Right, great, All right, and with that, I I will now turn it to the board for questions or comments, and I'll start with Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Um, I appreciate if uh, we could get a little more information about the benefits of the structural soil. Uh, I just started learning about this in my research leading up to this meeting. And um, I know I talked to one landscape architect who said that, you know, they're designed for urban environments. They really help the tree roots behave sort of more appropriately and more healthy. W would, would that, uh, would the structural soil for the new trees that went in, would it reduce the chances of the roots coming up and buckling the brick and, and cause, causing the same problems? Is that kind of what it does? Among yes, the a structural soil is one that is designed that can support the weight of the sidewalk or the structure above it, but still provides um, voids and ability for roots to grow 
in a, in a more natural pattern than they would in a very dense and compacted soil. So in a dense and compacted soil, the roots often come to the surface looking for moisture. They can't find it deeper down because, the, because of the dense um, nature of the soil. But in a structural soil, it, it, it's, it's, it's just more aerated and, and, and provides for better root growth. Okay, yeah, thank you. And, and I, should, I should add too that, um, you know, we, we are, our, we're concerned is not just for our, our bricks to be compromised, but we want the trees to be healthy and happy too. And it sounds like this is both as a twofer, right? It does both of those things. Yes. Um, can you talk about the pr proposed size of what, what new trees you, if we do remove these, um, it's not a decision that we take lightly, but if you did, what, what's the size of the trees that would replace them compared to what that we have now? And then, you know, both immediately and then also kind of when they're mature, how their shade canopy and, and overall size of the tree would, would, would compare to what we have. Sure. The, the proposed replacement trees uh, range from anywhere from a, a three and a half inch to a five inch caliber tree, which is a significantly larger than the street trees we typically plant um, on the side streets. Mm -hmm. uh, these, those are what's called a bare root and we get them smaller so they can fit in the grass strip. Here we have more room to play with. So we're trying to get a, a, a bit more established tree in place without being too large where it would be shocked and not necessarily take to the new environment. So there's a little bit of a balancing act of how large of a tree we can actually plant here. Mm -hmm. um, the, the proposed trees are uh, red maples uh, along the storefront, and they have a more of a, a, a vase-shaped um, canopy that we're proposing so that we can stay away from the, the building fronts, but yet still um, get tall and, 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 and have a bit of a, a broad canopy. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some zelkovas, which are much more when grown a much more significant canopy than the honey locusts that are out there. Mm -hmm. And we are also proposing to replace uh, a few with honey locusts, similar to we have, mm -hmm. but obviously in a, in a setting that we hope they'll thrive. Yeah. So. Um, thank you. And do you have, a, 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 give us an idea of, um, assuming that we have the improvements of the structural soil so that the trees could be healthier and happier and grow faster, presumably. Mm -hmm. um, how, what period of time are we looking at before we, you think we, we might be kind of a comparable level of, of shade or canopy than what we have now with honey locusts? I would, I've asked this question and it's, and it's difficult for the landscapers to predict how a tree will react in an urban environment. But yeah. I've been given an indication, um, 10, 12 years, I think you'll, they will, they will be significant enough that um, it will feel more inviting. Okay. Um, okay, great. Uh, that's all my questions I have for now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Um, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess, I think I just had two questions um, for Mr. Rademacher, um, but I will preface it by saying um, I do know that our DPW director, Mr. Rademacher, and the tree warden and others are definitely um, sensitive to this issue. Um, I'm getting a thing on my screen saying I have low audio, so I don't know if I'm coming through. But my question is, um, is it true that um, if we left the trees that are slated to um, be replaced, that the construction un undoubtedly would um, render most, if not all of them, not viable. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understood the question. Well, I, I've spoken to, not Cloris Rowe, some landscape architect people, and spoke about this project. And they said, if the trees were left there, that undoubtedly the construction would probably render them oh. um, not as viable and they probably would die. I, correct, I, I would agree. I've been given the same um, advice and opinion from the professionals I spoke to. Because of the levels of stress the trees are currently showing, 
the stress of a construction project um, would likely put them over the top. And then um, I guess my other question would be um, sort of similar to Mr. Helmet's questions around the trees we're putting in. And I think I heard this from you, the soil replacement that you're proposing, similar to trees dying during the construction, trees planted after the construction would have a more uh, better chance of taking root and growing um, as well as a lot of people have asked me, are you going to replace the total brick Broadway Plaza with total brick or is it going to be a different configuration? So, so your first question, yes, the trees planted um, with this project, yes, will all be planted in the structural soil and, and will have the, the greatest chance of thriving um, because of that. I, and I can continue on and show you a colored rendering of what the plaza um, proposed to look like. And the, the theme here is to continue what we did with the sidewalk. So a white concrete with a border of red, not bricks, but concrete stamped to look like bricks. Okay, thank you. Because a lot of people were concerned that the actual brick con configuration would go back in and there's a lot of mobility disability issues around that. So thank you for that answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one question and a few comments, and this is just, I know you went, it was quite late when you're on Mr. Rademacher last week, but what you, I think you were asked a question at that time about the number of trees total that were planted by DPW, whether it be this year to date versus the trees that were taken out. And do you have that figure in front of you or available? I do. Um, currently in the, in the current calendar year, We've planted 200 and approximately 220 trees and removed 82. I expect the planting number to double. We have a fall program that we're anticipating planting another 200 plus trees. And, but unfortunately, I, I also anticipate between now and the end of the year due to health and, and failing um, conditions, we, we probably end up removing another 80. We, we're on average remove about between 150 and 180 trees a year. I did total over the past four years, um, Public Works has planted approximately 1114 trees and removed 763. And uh, those 763 are, are were either failing or fell in a storm, right? Those were not trees that we, healthy trees that we, that we elected to take down. Thank you. And I just reiterate what some of my colleagues have said that we certainly, of all the things that we do on this board, one job that we do not take lightly is there, whenever we're requested to approve the removal of any trees. Um, this particular plan, this has been in the works for a few years. This was subject to the plan as a whole, not just the tree aspect of it, but the Broadway Plaza reconstruction plan was subject to a number of public forums what, back when we had public forums where people could come in and see what, what the plans were and comment. Uh, I know we talked about it at the parking advisory committee a number of times. We went through with Mr. Rodemarker what the plans were and they were approved way back when. I would, as someone that uses Arlington Center quite often, I was saddened that we had to wait to implement the plan because we had to wait for the MWRA work, I would like to see this go forward before, but I am excited to finally move forward. We have a number of, of uh, residents who often reach out to us before about the brick sidewalks, but I've never in all my tenure on the, this board met anyone who likes the current configuration of Broadway Plaza. Um, and so I look forward to the work and I'd just like to say, again, the, the town of Arlington, DPW, this board has always had been forward thinking as far as the tree canopy, and we've always invested in the tree canopy just by the, the numbers that we, Mr. Rodmark, I just 
provided to us. And also we've had, I'm I have, and I'm sure you all have had many residents, one of the, one of the, one of the repeated requests that I get from residents is people who want to take the trees out in front of their house and the tree warden will go out and deem the tree is healthy and the, because the residents want out for other reasons because a, a tree limb fell it's not always mean that the tree needs to be taken out and the trees aren't taken out unless they're unhealthy trees um so we do take that very seriously i, I think the town has protected its tree canopy very well and we always continue to be forward thinking and planting more trees than we're taking down and only taking down trees were absolutely necessary. So and so I do look forward to this plan being implemented and I'll reserve any motions till after we hear from the public. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will reserve um, possible questions and comments until after we hear uh, from residents. Thank you. And before I open it up to public comment, um, Mr. Rademacher, you had mentioned that the proposed timetable is in the spring, I believe April, and that's for the removal of the trees. What's the timetable for the planting of the new trees? Is it upon, um, I, don't, I don't know if there's a, a, a time frame between when they'd be removed and when the new ones would go in. The, it would be all within the same uh, construction project. I, I would hope this is maybe a, a, a one to two month project that should start as soon as um, weather allows in the spring and, and go from there. Okay, and just a question on the four trees that are um, scheduled to, to remain at the site and, and the one in particular that, that I've noticed has some, some issues in terms of buckling is the one on Medford Street um, the further uh, in the upper left hand corner. What, what criteria was used to maybe establish that those trees can be saved versus the ones that are slated for removal? The one um, that you referenced along Medford Street is probably going to be the most challenging to retain. Um, but we felt because it was on the outskirt of the plaza and not necessarily right in the middle of a, the, the, a walking route, if we have to extend some of the flexible pavement a little bit or, or play with the grades over there, it, we, we felt we could do that at that location. Um, it's going to be challenging. Uh, all, the, all these trees that we are proposing to retain will, will be challenging, but um, because of their location, we thought we, we would have a better chance. Okay, and, and any trees of those four trees, if unfortunately none of them survive, they would each be replaced? They would be replaced. We won't, uh, you probably won't know they won't survive until a year or two or yeah. somewhat later. Um, we can replace them. Unfortunately, we will be replacing them in the urban soils that exist today and not in the, in the, the structural soil because we wouldn't be able to install that while the tree is in place. All right, thank you, Mr. Rademacher. Okay, so at this point, I will open it up to public comment. First hand is Joanne Preston. Good evening, Ms. Preston. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> I'm left over from last time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Joanne Preston, Mystic Lake Drive, town meeting member precinct nine, which encompasses Broadway Plaza. Um, I would like to respond to Mr. Rockemacher and I have a response to all of his comments, but I can't do it in three minutes. Um, I attended the last meeting of the tree committee in which he informed us of his plan to cut down nine healthy mature trees in Broadway Plaza. Some tree committee members asked that some alternatives to cutting them down be explored. 
I concur with this request because we have a lot of time till the spring. Um, and I know from other communities, there are alternatives to cutting down mature trees and what are called hardscapes, which is what the Broadway Plaza will be and is what will be in the future. Um, I have sent an article to Mr. Rockamacher over a, year, a week ago, and I called several times to ask for his response. Um, none of what is in that article has been incorporated in his remarks. I will just say that since I have so little time, they include things like root barriers to avoid buckling, uh, root paths, which Cambridge uses routinely, um, and also ADA, ADU compliant tree grates that can be employed to ensure flat surfaces. Also in that article, they talk about how to improve the soil, which we've been discussing, in which, with keeping the mature trees. Now, <clears throat> I think I only have one minute left. So why preserve these? Yeah, you have about a minute and a half. So take, take it. <laughs> why preserve these healthy, mature trees? Because already Arlington is in the midst of the effects of climate change. I don't think, I think you will know that this summer we had the hottest June on record and records been kept for over a hundred years and the wettest July on record. And most recently, we barely averted a hurricane, which now has accompanying tornadoes. The carbon removed from these mature trees on Broadway Plaza is critically important to slowing down climate change, especially in an area where there's so much carbon. Um, more, um, these small replacement trees will not slow down climate change for two decades, I did the calculations. That's on three inch trees. Um, in two decades, even in one decade, scientists say it will be too late. Moreover, these mature shade trees will prevent a heat island, which we already have five of in Arlington. Um, so they'll make Broadway Plaza a heat island, which is not only bad for people, but businesses especially with those with outdoor seating. As you know, in June, we had, temp we had one temperature 100 degrees. Nobody's gonna wanna sit out on the plaza in the sun because these little trees will not shade them. I think certainly there are reasons enough to take time to explore some of these other methods to preserve at least some of the mature trees. And I asked the select board to consider Meet that um, a meeting with the tree committee, other interested people, and the DPW to discuss these possibilities. And I hope. Excuse me, Miss President, if you could wrap up. Okay, this is the part of the article that I sent to the director of DPW. I hope he gets to look at it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next name is Beth Malofchik. Hello, Ms. Malofchik. Sorry. Um, Beth Malofchek, um, Russell Street, town meeting member, also for Precinct 9. Um, I, uh, I would just uh, hope that the um, town leadership, the select board, and um, DPW uh, will um, heartily uh, acknowledge uh, Code Red, the concern that the UN has expressed in their report for climate change. And I, I respectfully ask that the preservation of mature trees be prioritized generally, so that moving forward, any projects on municipal land 
the starting point be the preservation of existing trees and enhancing uh, tree cover, in whatever the project is there. We have heat islands adjacent to Broadway Plaza that have not been uh, remediated. Um, uh, what's it called? Russell Parking, <laughs> it's a disaster. It's a, it's a heat island disaster. Um, and so the removal of these trees uh, as per the plan is gonna make this place even hotter than it is now. And a um, colleague who lives uh, near the Mystic Lakes in a tree covered area expressed that where she lives, it's five degrees cooler than Broadway Plaza now. So that's only gonna get worse. Uh, and waiting for the tech canopy to fill out. I hope you are re-examining your choice for benches because sitting on a black metal bench will presumably be impossible when the temperatures are in the 90s, 80s and 90s. So I hope that will be re-examined. Um, uh, I, uh, again, wanting the preservation of trees to be the, um, I want town leadership to embrace the preservation of trees. So looking at Whittemore Park, um, I'd like to encourage uh, the select board to query DPW as to what's being done to uh, remediate the compaction of soil. I watched five heavy cement trucks uh, go across Whittemore Park when they were uh, laying that sidewalk. So are you going to come in with air shovels and loosen up that soil or what's the protocol so that the existing trees are not adversely affected by those five ginormous cement trucks? Um, Mr. Rademacher uh, very graciously uh, gave us the numbers for the uh, number of trees removed, number of trees planted. I respectfully ask for the, um, uh, the DBH for removed and DBH planted so that we can see whether there is a net loss of diameter of the tree canopy. Town leadership moving forward, this should be uh, essential information because we cannot do a tree for tree. Your, your timer and, I, and mine are about the same. So if you, if you can just wrap up. Uh, thank you. In the next okay, few so seconds. Thank we, you. We can't do a tree for the tree for tree equation means nothing because the loss of canopy is greater than that one tree replacement. So moving forward, please embrace tree preservation, redo your plans, get better <laughs> landscape designers, um, because we know what's coming and it's going to be hotter and stronger storms. We need the trees. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Malachek. Next speaker is Robin Bergman. Good evening, Miss Bergman. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. So I actually, uh, Robin Bergman, Park Avenue. Um, I want to agree with both of the previous speakers, Joanne Preston and Beth Malopchik. And they've said pretty much what I was going to say, plus more, more details and facts. I just want to say that we know a lot more now about um, how important the tree canopy is and how uh, dire the situation is with Code Red and how much we need our mature trees and just replacing tree for tree with little tiny trees is not going to do it. It's going to take too long for those trees to become mature trees. So I would also ask you to start prioritizing keeping the mature trees in town as much as possible. And thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Steve Revelak. Good evening, Mr. Revelak. Uh, actually, before you start, congratulations on your appointment to the Redevelopment Board. Thank you very much, Mr. DeCourcy. Um, so Steve Revelak, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. I don't want to diminish the myriad of benefits that trees offer, but I, I think the claim that preserving these trees uh, as a, you know, the need to preserve these trees to um, mitigate climate change isn't terribly realistic. 
Uh, I, I think it's more symbolic than substantive. Yes, the planet is warming, and it's warming because of greenhouse gas emissions. And these greenhouse gas emissions are coming from extracting and burning fossil fuels, and that is a needle we have to move. You know, we reduce emissions from buildings and from transportation, or we live with the, with the consequences. Um, given the you know replacement plan, I don't see replacing a few trees on Broadway as making a, a very consequential difference. Now, having said that, I want to take a note about something the city of Paris in France has been doing under the leadership of their mayor, Anne Hidalgo. First, they uh, decommissioned an expressway along one side of the Seine River and replaced it with a park, uh, several hectares of park. And they also have plans to remove roughly half of the city's on-street parking spaces. That's about 35,000 parking spaces in total, with the intention of returning the space to people rather than to cars. So, I mean, the actual nuts and bolts of how that's going to work will be figured out over time, but I think it's not unreasonable to expect something like green space, uh, mobility trails, and outdoor dining. Um, we have 100 miles of public ways, and we could actually plant a lot of trees if we could just, you know, get rid of some of the parking. Um, I think that Broadway Plaza is long overdue for improvements. Like Mr. Hurd, I don't know anyone who really loves the configuration as it is. And I would encourage the board to um, give the approval so that this work can go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rivoli. One remaining speaker, Aaron Bumgarner. Good evening, Ms. Baumgartner. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Erin Baumgartner. I live on Palmer Street. Uh, I don't really have many specifics to, to add. Um, I, I think there have been a lot of good comments here. I am definitely not a tree expert, um, but I think uh, I've heard the opinions of people on the tree committee who I've listened in to those calls um, and have been really impressed by how knowledgeable uh, that group of people are, and I, I imagine that other um, members on this call are probably more in the category uh, like me of not necessarily being a tree expert, but uh, sharing similar values um, in the end goal. So I guess I would just argue or suggest it's, I think Joanne suggested this earlier, that there's time for more discussion and um, for thinking outside the box of um, potentially other solutions. So I would just um, encourage that possibility. Great. Thank you for your comments. I believe there's one more person yeah. who may have a technical problem, but is yeah. Susan Stamps wish to be heard? Trying to raise her hand, so I will promote her. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, that's weird. Sure. It said my hand was raised, but apparently it wasn't showing up anyway. Um, I, my name is Susan Stamps. I live on Grafton Street, town meeting member, precinct three, and a member of the Arlington Tree Committee. Um, the tree committee is appointed by the select board to promote the protection, planting, and care of trees in Arlington. Mike Rademacher, um, our DPW superintendent who's in charge also um, the tree department and the tree warden is under um, the supervision of Mike uh, Rademacher. And um, I wanna take a moment to express my appreciation to Mike and to our tree warden, Tim LeCleef, who um, have done a great job in Arlington with trees. Um, Mr. Rademacher did come to the tree committee two weeks ago, reviewed this plan that he showed to you tonight and we did not take a vote, but the sense of the committee was, there wasn't one person there who thought this plan was okay. There was no one there who thought it was okay to remove nine mature, healthy trees from a key public space in the center of Arlington. I do agree with all the previous speakers about in the age of climate change, our president has declared cold code red and 
I think the tree committee has kind of declared code red too. And we really, it's going to be very difficult for us to think it's okay to, re, to remove mature trees. Um, the, the plaza, as others have said, is already a very hot place. And if you can just imagine that plaza with all these little trees around, it is going to be very hot and the businesses are gonna lose business in the summertime. There's no question about that. Everyone, including the tree committee, and I personally love the idea of resurfacing that plaza. I agree, it's, it's terrible, um, totally non-compliant with, with ADA and unfair to people with disabilities. Completely agree with that. But, the, but, but that doesn't mean definitely that those trees have to be removed. The tree committee asked um, Mr. Rademacher to go back talk to the consultant. Um, I don't know if there's an actual landscape architect as a consultant on the project, but we asked him to go back and he did seem open to the idea since the trees are not going to be removed until next spring to put a pause on, try to come up with a design that at least will save some of those trees. There, there are probably some creative things that can be done with those trees that will mitigate the bumps like, well, just an idea I came up with today is that you could create um, little planting islands around the trees with bushes and flowers and things like that. So that would keep people away from the raised spaces ar around the trees. They wouldn't be tripping over them anymore and it would look beautiful. I think there's a lot of creative things that could be done if the will is there to do it. And, um, this is not about thinking that this project doesn't need to go forward. It does need to go forward, but we think that we would like to see um, an extreme effort made to keep as many of those trees as possible. Um, <clears throat> the, um, let's see if there's anything else I needed to say. But, um, I, I, do, um, I do note that um, when Mr. Rademacher was talking about the project, he did mention frequently that he had consulted with experts. I didn't hear him talking about the tree warden. And as the board may recall, uh, two or three years ago, the select board did adopt a policy whereby any, um, anything, any town projects involving trees, removal, planting, anything else, there would be a consultation with the tree warden. Of course, Mr. Rodemarker has talked to the tree warden about it. And the tree warden said at the tree committee, really all he had to say, which was, you know, they're mature trees. So, you know, why would he be in favor of taking them down? Um, but as far as things that maybe could be done to save those trees, I would like to see not just outside experts, but, but our own tree warden um, to be, you know, to see what he might have to offer in the tree committee stands ready to, um, to, to back up, um, as always, um, our DPW superintendent and our tree warden in trying to get these important projects done um, in a way that's gonna be great for the town, but will also preserve as many mature trees as possible because as someone else mentioned, we just went through the hottest June on record. Um, according to Google, um, uh, Massachusetts is among the top 10 fastest warming states in the country. Um, this is, this is we, we, we can't be cutting down mature trees. We need them for the shade, the cleaning the air, the cooling. Um, and so I would urge the board to just put a pause on this, uh, not approve removal of the nine trees tonight. Um, give Mr. Rademacher um, a chance to um, do some further uh, work on this and um, come back in the spring and talk about it again. That's what we, that's what the tree committee would ask. Okay, th 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 thank you, Ms. Stamps. And for those of you wondering why that was much more than three minutes, I forgot to reset my timer. So <laughs> you were the benefit of that. I had extra time, thank you. Um, okay, thank you for your comments. We appreciate the work that you're doing on the tree committee. Uh, Mr. Rodemarker? 
Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I would I would like to add that I since I did since my meeting with the tree committee, I, I did both things that I suggested I would. I met with the designers, um, landscape architect on site, and we reviewed tree by tree um, what could possibly done or be done or any way to work around the tree. Um, it's just an unfortunate, the, the stress of these trees and the, the root growth and the buckling of the pavement and wanting to build a, an ADA compliant surface did not lend itself to any new revelations on um, saving any of these trees. Uh, and I, I did the same with um, Tim LaQueeve, the tree wood. I don't, I don't make any decisions about trees without consulting the tree one. So uh, that goes without saying, but we, we did the same thing. We, we walked the site and I, I don't wanna speak for him, but basically the gist was the, the stress level these trees are showing and the condition of the roots with the surface, it does not make it conducive to, to save them. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rademacher. So I, I will now return to the board for any comments, questions, or motions, and I will come back in the same order that I was in, um, starting with Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Um, before I, I just want one final question, I have, then I have some comments, and then I think I am prepared to make a motion. Um, with respect to um, timeline, what would be the impact on the project uh, if we did delay for, for some period of time. Um, and I know that that's kind of a separate question from whether we expect that we can find alternatives, but I'm just trying to get a sense for, do we need to make this decision now? The contract uh, has been awarded by the MWRA for the utility work and the restoration work. So um, they, they have funding set aside. The town has funding set aside for this project to begin in the spring. If there was any sub significant change um, we have very little time to design and amend that contract. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I do not do this lightly. I have enormous appreciation for my friends on the tree committee and, and the new select board liaison to them. And I have listened very carefully. And I've also done a fair amount of work um, on my own in conjunction with, with the town manager and consulted a couple of, of other uh, folks. Um, I will move approval for this, but I want to explain why. Um, I think that leaving mature trees is a really good default position because of code red, because of shade canopy. And I think the town does that. I also think that you can't have a practical discussion unless you make those decisions in the context of a specific project. And we do that from time to time. And I don't think we should automatically prioritize leaving mature tree when they're in conditions that are causing them to be stressed, causing them to be health, unhealthy over the long term, um, especially if we're in a place now where we can permanently change the, the, the conditions by adding structural soils that will give new trees that go in a much better chance of being healthy, of growing, and providing long term benefit. And I say that with an eye towards. Um, carbon sequestration. I really think that we need to think long-term about this and not just short-term, never cut down a mature tree. I don't like doing it, but I think if we think the long-term, just, just from a carbon point of view, the long-term picture for this plaza is I wanna have trees there that for the long-term, longer than 10 years, will be able to keep doing what they do to capture carbon from the air keep doing what they do to, keep, to prevent that from becoming a heat island. And this is my concern. Uh, I believe the, our DPW director, when he said he has consulted landscape architects and arborists to assess the condition of the trees as stress. Uh, I am not an expert, but I went down and looked and I can't see anything to my mind that, that, I, that makes me disagree with them. Um, but, I, but I leave that to the experts and I trust the experts. Um, if they're not happy, if they haven't had significant growth, and they're at high risk for damage uh, when we attempt to do a, plea, a plaza reconstruction. This is the risk that we're taking. If we leave them um, and they die and we have to take them out because they become even more unhealthy, then new trees that go in are gonna go in the same bad conditions. 
and they're going to be set up for the same problems over the medium and long term with roots they're going to cr crop up and make the trees unhappy they're going to make the surface un un unfriendly to humans and are not going to have good long-range potential to do the things that we need them to do for the planet if we leave them when they die because all trees do new trees will have to go into the same bad soil and we have an opportunity to change that substrate for the long-term future. I think the reconstruction does it right. Um, structural soil was invented at Cornell. It's used all over Boston and Cambridge. It's from all from the experts I've talked to, very good. Um, and I think that it will allow future trees that go in, including the new ones, to thrive, to grow faster and be healthier for the long range. Um, and finally, it, nothing I've heard suggests that we can really do any improvements to the, to the health of these current trees if we don't remove them. And that's sad, but that's also, I believe, uh, the reality. Um, and then really finally, I, I think I've heard, I have some good people who have emailed us and said, these are optional trees. Let's not take these out if it's, if it's an option. And I'd say it depends on how you look at option. I think it's only optional if we mean it's a good option to not have an ADA compliant surface especially in the future, if the roots continue to do what they're doing. Um, it's an option if we think that it's, it's all right to leave these trees in bad soil and make them continue to be unhealthy and should probably shorten their lifespan. Um, and we think it's all right to set up a long-term situation where we, we just perpetuate the, 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 the not good soil conditions for these trees. So I realize that because I'm not an arborist, I have to rely on the experts of those who are. I, I'm confident, I feel comfortable that the EPD director has done his homework, has done what, what he's been asked to do. Um, and so I don't see the delay would, would change much. Uh, when I just said, I'm open to my, my colleagues disagreeing with me, um, but I will move uh, approval of the motion. Again, to be clear that I'm doing that actually out of thinking about the long-term benefit to the planet and to the plaza for all trees that will live there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. I'll second that. Uh, Mr. Hurd, thank, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd? Thank you. I'll support the motion. I don't want to reiterate everything that I've said and well, how Mr. Helmuth so eloquently said it, but just to say, we, do, we don't take this lightly. It's just in this particular situation in order to move forward with this plan, this is the right move for the board at this time. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, so um, uh, a few questions. Um, so uh, to, um, to you, Mr. Chair, to um, uh, the um, director, uh, I'm going to um, kind of repeat uh, Mr. Helmer's question about the latest that we could um, put off this decision. I mean, what would be the latest minus two months you know, that, that we could uh, hold off on making a decision? You could, we could hold off on a decision, but if that decision requires redesigning the plaza, then we can't, you know what I mean? Like, gotcha. we, okay. right, we need, to, if we were going to redesign the plaza, you'd want to do it now. Right. Okay. Got it. Got it. All right. And so, so I, I better understand the answer that you gave um, last time. Thank you. Uh, and so, um, and I, I, I was winning the day for me are two things. I mean, uh, the um, the soil improvement, I mean, and the fact that the trees aren't healthy, and and I say that with some trepidation because Miss um, Stamps said that they are, and and she's also in precinct three, not too far away from me, and so I'm afraid of disagreeing with her. But but I think you know, I mean, when I went through the plaza, you I know, mean, uh, I'm not an expert myself either, and I looked at the trees, I mean, and I mean, I walked through it fairly frequently, and I was like, well, I mean, they they do look like they're in rough shape, but then you're saying that they are, so that confirms at least how uh, they they look to me. Uh, but uh, Ms. Preston had brought up the possibility of rejuvenating the soil. Is that really a possibility? The um... Uh, Mr. Chair, if I, if I may. Um, sir, thank you. The the details, and I apologize to Ms. Preston for not getting back to her. The, the details that she had sent to me were, were really oriented around planting new, not yeah. about trying to save existing. Um, the root guards and the and, and the things of that nature are, are, is infrastructure you put to try to prevent root growth on new trees. Um, 
And so I, I don't believe um, that we can apply that to try to save these existing. Got you. Okay, thank you very much, Meet. And and uh, one more, uh, well, actually two more questions to um, the director, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, uh, I mean, my understanding is a lot of work has been done about, and you've explored a lot of avenues, Meet. Are you aware of any avenues that haven't been explored with respect to me making the soil better? Because I mean, we got to make the soil better. If we can't do that. Then, then I mean, I think the the we we really have no option but to he proceed along the lines of this motion? Uh, so if there was an avenue I knew of and didn't explore, that, that, would, that would be a, um, a shame on me. So I, I, we have explored all avenues that I'm aware of. Uh, we, I, as far as making the soil better, you could potentially um, try to uh, fertilize it, but you're, you're not going to be able to relieve the compaction. Uh, issues of the roots, nor the location of those roots right at the surface. For us to for us to leave those trees in place and build a compliant surface at the elevation it needs to be, we would be grinding and removing roots on these trees that would most um, definitely cause their immediate demise. Yes, and, and I wasn't really uh, <laughs> accusing you of any no, no, I, mal or non-feasance. I mean, sometimes we don't explore paths because sure. they're expensive. I mean, it's like, well, that's just economically viable. And so that's really kind of what I was getting at. And uh, and so um, so I mean, with respect to the tree for tree replacement, I get that argument. I mean, uh, for the trees that we were, like, well, let's just take one of the trees. I mean, how many small trees would replace one of those? In terms of like the carbon sequestration, you know, uh, I, I don't know that offhand. Often, one rule of thumb is to try to replace um, the diameter of the tree. So if you have a 12-inch diameter tree, you try to replace it with enough trees to total 12-inch, so three four-inch diameter trees. Um, I don't know if that's a one-for-one one as far as carbon sequestration, but I know that's an often uh, formally used by conservation commissions when you're replacing trees in a in, in a in a resource area. Um, yeah, well, well, thank you very much, I Mina. Mean, and and I know that there have been some calls me for us to increase the rate at which be the town is planting trees, and and I support that. But even more so, I support I me mean, uh, everyone in town I mean, trying to uh, plant more trees. I mean, and and we should do that in, in an intelligent way, and, uh, meaning finding right species. And, and so I, uh, as I've mentioned to uh, several people, I think that is a place where the new civic engagement group can play a role, I meaning with um, you and the tree warden and, and I mean, let's work on getting a lot more trees planted, I meaning in, in public and non-public places, but I am gonna support the motion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Yeah, and I'm also going to support Mr. Helmut's motion. I want to thank him for the detailed reasoning behind the motion, which I found compelling um, for the for the long term effects. And and of course, you know, this has now happened a few times since I've been on the board. No one likes to approve the removal of mature trees, and and you view it as as something that if, if you can avoid it, you do it. But I think in this case, given the scope of the project and given the description in terms of the health of the trees and what could happen as the, the plaza is being rebuilt, um, this this feels like the best option. And, and so while we appreciate the work of the, the tree committee and we take their the work very seriously, I think in, in this instance, having looked into this, having had discussions, having heard the comments of my colleagues tonight, I'm inclined to support Mr. Helmuth's motion as well. So on a motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, I will turn it to attorney. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Uh, before I say yes, if I could ask our DBW director, Mr. Helmuth, uh, Mr. Rademacher, I promoted Mr. Helmuth. Uh, is Mr. Rademacher, I have just a real quick brief thing under new business. If you could stay on this meeting, if you can't, that's okay. I'll fill you in tomorrow, but yeah. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rodemarker. Thank you. I and, and thank you for the comments tonight too, for, for those who participated. 
Um, okay, next is new business. Uh, Attorney Heim. No new business. Thank you. Mr. Chapdelaine? No new business. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Mr. Helmer. No new business, but I will note that if I did get promoted to DPW, it certainly pays better. <laughs> Mr. Diggins. But would it really be as satisfying, Mr. Helmer's way? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and just imagine if we attacked this meeting on to uh, the last week's meeting. We'd be here till two o'clock in the morning. No new business. Thank you. And Mr. Hurd. I have no new business, but I will say that I can confirm that Mr. Rademacher was out there looking at the trees last week because I did. I walked through while he was doing it and saw him. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I apologize or congratulate both Mr. Rademacher and Mr. Helmet. Um, my, my three quick things. My first new business is I wanted to talk about this back in May and because of the items and issues that have been before us, I've worked with the chair and put it off, but I really want to discuss it at the next meeting. And it has to do with um, the DPW Grove Street um, construction uh, project. And, and, and the reason I want to discuss it, it's sort of in line with myself and my colleagues' um, support of town employees, um, just because of my regular day job in terms of uh, construction projects. Uh, and I've had conversations with the chair as well as with Jeff Bailman on the school project because of a GC and some subs that worked on the Woburn Public Library that resulted in, in not something great. Um, I just wanna uh, let Mr. Rademacher know that I have conversations with the chair and I'm, I hope at the next select board meeting, it will be an agenda item because I definitely agreed to put it off since May. I wanna talk about the uh, project, especially the hazardous waste um, component of the DPW Grove Street project uh, around the GC, the sub and the sub subs, because that's something that really sort of, especially the sub sub issue, um, um, regarding asbestos, OSHA 10, OSHA 30, uh, certified workers down there. So I, I just wanted, if he could, and I think he did, Mr. Rademacher, to hang around for that call. And I definitely anticipate at our next meeting we'll be discussing that. And then the other two items, very quickly, uh, I did speak to uh, the town manager and let him know I was going to bring this up under new business, something that the entire board has been contacted about, which is the MBTA buses um, in Arlington, 77 and 79, especially around um, when the school children are going to uh, Arlington High, Audison and Matinon. Um, I don't know if the manager has anything to add to that or an update on that through you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chapdelaine? No update beyond Representative Sean Garbley has really been the leader on this effort in speaking directly with the GM of the MBTA in receiving commitments that they would increase service. I don't believe we've seen it yet. So we, we will keep asking and keep advocating and demanding. Uh, I mean, I think the loss of the 79 is really probably the biggest impact here and the reduced frequency of the 77. But I think the, uh, my, you know, layman's or layperson's approach is, you know, no 79 means you have significantly fewer buses in the morning than you would have otherwise. Okay, and I guess I would, through the chair, to the town manager, since we're only getting the 77 now, and we pay a ridiculous amount in our MBTA assessment, if we could explore some legal option, even if it's a long shot, to hold back the money that we give to the MBTA, kind of assess what our one bus 77 um, assessment would be and kind of make a some kind of statements to the MBTA or through Attorney Heim in his office, um, because I think we pay the second highest rate behind Braintree at Quincy. And right now we just have one bus going through town that isn't working. And then um, the third thing is um, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, if the town manager can either answer this tonight or provide the board 
um, with an answer uh, tomorrow, because uh, I know we're all getting these questions. I've gotten a lot of questions around um, residents in there who are 70 plus who are looking for booster shots. I know the town was very responsive, um, not only for town employees, but also for um, elderly res residents, as well as immunocompromised, being able to have some clinics down at Arlington High School, as well as uh, going to individual homes. So I know myself, I have, and my colleagues um, have gotten requests about people who are appropriate for a third booster shot, which I believe is age 70 and older or, or immunocompromised, if the town is going to either a be able to offer a clinic again, um, probably not at Arlington High School and or um, if uh, residents who fall under that umbrella of 70 plus or immunocompromised should contact the Board of Health to arrange um, home visits to get that booster shot. Sorry. So I can confirm and certainly follow up with the board tomorrow. Um, I believe right now we only have Pfizer on hand. So I think we would be able to provide uh, those who have, you know, had taken previously a Pfizer shot, uh, but I'll confirm with Christian Bongiorno what exactly we can do and when we might be able to do it and let the board know. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. And, and just on the, the first item that you raised, I believe it was the first item on the DPW that the fact that that hasn't come before the board is because of my overscheduling out of last several meetings and, and the DPW presentation has been bumped a couple of times, but we will put it on for our, um, for our next meeting. Wanted to say briefly, we are, the Long Range Planning Committee will be getting together probably over the next few weeks. We have a smaller subset of that that um, we'll be meeting later this week and um, we've got some important issues coming up with that and the town manager and I believe Mrs. Mahan will be meeting in a smaller group um, within the next few days and then the last thing I wanted to say I'm following up with the town manager we've had some discussions about some um, correspondence between Verizon and residents at the housing authority properties regarding Verizon service that um, I don't have all the details on it, but it has to do with an upgrade that Verizon wants to make and it, it has been very troubling to to residents and to the authority and, and um, hopefully we can report back at our next meeting in, in terms of what if anything is going on in that and what our what our role could be. Um, so with that, um, that's all my new business I will take a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Okay, do a second? Okay, second. Uh, motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Diggins. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Madam, so can I vote? Thank you very much.